terms of where the situation stands. We do know a short time ago, President Biden wrapped up a call with transatlantic leaders. It lasted for about 45 minutes where they did discuss their ongoing concerns about Russia's continued buildup along the Ukrainian border. They also expressed their support for Ukraine's sovereignty and uh, talked about ways to potentially assist the country. They also talked about uh, ways to possibly de-escalate the situation because uh, the administration and uh, many of its allies continue to hope for a diplomatic, uh, you know, solution here. Uh, so that is uh, currently where things stand here at the White House. We certainly expect the president to address or touch on some of these topics when he speaks a short time from now. Thank you, Nicole. And we know that on that call, there were leaders from many NATO members. That's the Western Alliance uh, that has pledged to defend the areas, the 30 countries uh, that are member states surrounding Ukraine. But remember, NATO is not sending forces into Ukraine itself. President Biden has said that is not something he is willing to do. A national security correspondent, David Martin, is standing by at the Pentagon. Uh, David, we know that all all the reports from U.S. officials this morning and throughout the day have been about a further Russian military buildup. There is no clear sign of any kind of de-escalation. That's right. And uh, uh, there is intelligence which, in fact, uh, apparently can demonstrate, if it were declassified, that those uh, troop withdrawals we saw in videos released by the Russian Defense Ministry were, in fact, just a made-for-TV hoax, and, if, and the, the number of troops continues to go up. And uh, more importantly, the readiness of the troops continues to increase as they move into... Let's listen in. Good afternoon. Today, I made two vital calls, as I've been making for some months now. Two vital calls that uh, on the situation in Russia and Ukraine. The first was to a bipartisan group of members of Congress who are currently representing the United States, along with Vice President Harris at the Munich uh, Security Conference. The second was the latest in a series of calls over the past many months with the heads of state of our NATO allies and our, the European Union to bring them up to date on what the United States thinks is the current state of affairs and what's likely to happen in Ukraine in the coming days to ensure that we continue to remain in lockstep, that is, the European Union and NATO. Despite Russia's efforts to divide us at home and abroad, I can affirm that has not happened. The overwhelming message of both, on both calls was one of unity, determination, and resolve. I shared with all of those on the calls what we know about a rapidly escalating crisis in Ukraine. Over the last few days, we've seen reports of a major uptick in violations of the ceasefire by Russian-backed fighters attempting to provoke Ukraine in the Donbas. For example, a shelling of a Ukrainian kindergarten yesterday, which Russia has falsely asserted was carried out by Ukraine. And we also uh, continue to see more and more disinformation being pushed out by to the Russian public, including Russian-backed separatists, claiming that Ukraine is planning to launch a massive offensive attack in the Donbas. Well, look, there is simply no evidence of these assertions, and it defies, defies basic logic. Embrace the opportunity. Logic to believe the Ukrainians would choose this moment with well over 150,000 troops arrayed on its borders to escalate a year long conflict. Russia's state media also continues to make phony allegations of a genocide taking place in the Donbas and push fabricated claims warning about Ukraine's attack on Russia without any evidence. That's just what I'm sure Ukraine's thinking of doing attacking Russia. All of these are consistent with the playbook the Russians have used before to set up a false justification to act against Ukraine. This is also in line with the pretext scenarios that the United States and our allies and partners have been warning about for weeks. Throughout these tense moments, the Ukrainian forces have shown great judgment and, I might add, restraint 
They refused to allow the Russians to bait them into war. But the fact remains, Russian troops currently have Ukraine surrounded from Belarus along the Russian border and with Ukraine to the Black Sea in the south and all of its border. You know, look, we have reason to believe the Russian forces are planning to uh, and intend to attack Ukraine in the coming week, in the coming days. We believe that they will target Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, a city of 2.8 million innocent people. We're calling out Russia's plans loudly and repeatedly, not because we want a conflict, but because we're doing everything in our power to remove any reason that Russia may give to justify invading Ukraine and prevent them from moving. Ukraine and prevent them from moving. Make no mistake, if Russia pursues its plans, it will be responsible for a ca catastrophic and needless war of choice. The United States and our allies are prepared to defend every inch of NATO territory from any threat to our collective security as well. We also will not send troops in to fight in Ukraine, but we will continue to support the Ukrainian people. This past year, the United States provided a record amount of security assistance to Ukraine to bolster its defensive, $650 million from Javelin missiles to ammunition. We also previously provided $500 million in Ukraine and humanitarian aid and economic support for Ukraine. And earlier this week, we also announced an additional sovereign loan guarantee of up to $1 billion to strengthen Ukraine's economic resilience. But the bottom line is this. The United States and our allies and partners will support the Ukrainian people. We will hold Russia accountable for its actions. The West is united and resolved. We're ready to impose severe sanctions on Russia if it further invades Ukraine. But I say again, Russia can still choose diplomacy. It is not too late to de-escalate and return to the negotiating table. Last night, Russia agreed that Secretary of State Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov should meet on, Fe uh, on February 24th, February 24th in Europe. But if Russia takes military action before that date, we'll be clear that they have slammed the door shut on diplomacy. They will have enchanted will visit upon them. You know, there are many issues that divide our nation and our world. But standing up to Russian aggression is not one of them. The American people are united. Europe is united. The transatlantic community is united. Our political parties in this country are united. The entire free world is united. Russia has a choice between war and all the suffering it will bring or diplomacy that will make a future safer for everyone. Now, I'm happy to take a few questions. Uh, Nancy from Bloomberg. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Do you think that it is wise for President Zelensky to leave Ukraine if an invasion is as imminent as the U.S. says it is? That's a judgment for him to make and a determination as to whether or not. I've spoken with Zelensky a dozen times, maybe more, I don't know. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, in, in, in the pursuit of a, di a diplomatic solution. Uh, it may not be fall, it may, may be the wise choice, but it's his decision. And do you have any indication about whether President Putin has made a decision on whether to invade? Do you feel confident that he that he hasn't made that decision already? As of this moment, I'm convinced he's made the decision. We have reason to believe that. There seems to be a unanimity of spirit to do between the United States and Europe to do some sanctions, the comprehensive sanctions. But are, is everyone on board with the exact same sanctions that you want to do? Uh, yes, um, there will be some slight differences, but none. There will be more add-ons than subtractions. And, and President Putin is going to oversee some nuclear drills this weekend. How do you see that happening? What, what's your reaction to that, sir? Thank you. Well, um, I don't think he is remotely contemplating nuclear, using nuclear weapons. But I do think it's, uh, I think he is um, focused on trying to convince the world that he has uh, the ability to change the dynamics uh, in Europe in a way that he cannot. Um, but I, I don't uh, 
how much of it is a, uh, a cover for just saying we're just doing exercises and, and there's more than that. I, I just can't. I, it's hard to read his mind. There's more than that. I, I just can't. I, it's hard to read his mind. Mr. You are convinced that President Putin is going to invade Ukraine. Is that what you just said a few moments yes, ago? Yes, I did. Yes. So is diplomacy off the table then? No. There's all, until he does, diplomacy is always a possibility. What reason do you have to believe he's considering that option at all? We have a significant intelligence capability. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Reason to believe that he, meaning Putin, has made the decision to invade Ukraine. The president says we have reason to believe that. He cited our significant intelligence capabilities. He was asked again uh, when he said that. The room erupted with reporters asking him to clarify that he believes, he meaning Biden, believes that Vladimir Putin has made the decision to invade Ukraine. And the president said very clearly, uh, unequivocally, yes. Uh, listening to the president, we are joined again by Evelyn Farkas and Ambassador Michael McFall. We've added to the conversation Rick Stengel, former Under Secretary of State. Meeting with the Secretary of State and Russia's top diplomat will not happen. The one is currently scheduled. Uh, I want to go now to national security correspondent David Martin, who is standing by at the Pentagon. David, a lot of really incredible information to be sharing publicly, information that the president says is, is really disinformation about what Russia is already doing to lay the groundwork for an invasion. And he is making clear that they are publicizing this uh, because it is part of a Russian strategy to destabilize the country. Um, David, I know from the sources I talked to, they really describe this as phase one of the attack. In other words, it's already underway. Another way of putting it, Margaret, is that we are witnessing the beginning of Vladimir Putin's endgame in Ukraine. Uh, if we can call these flag, false flag operations and disinformation, but we're not the people he's trying to convince. He's trying to convince his own population that there is a crisis in Ukraine, that <laughs> this fire he set, he now has to go in and, and put out. And he uh, is, we've seen him preparing for it for weeks. Now the president and what is certainly the major news out of uh, that appearance uh, says that the U.S. has reason to believe he has decided to invade. The goal was to split NATO, to split Western alliances, or even to split political parties in the United States. That effort has failed up to this point. In fact, the opposite has happened. The other element, too, is the president really echoing what we heard from his secretary of state, from his secretary of defense over the course of the last day or two, laying out in detail what the U.S. knows about potential efforts for pretext of invasion, false flag operations, uh, perhaps media reports that are false to try and lay the groundwork for an invasion, but also how an invasion would actually play out. Wolf, the president, detailing those things once again, making very clear that the U.S. is trying to stay on its front foot. What the president now says is a decision that's already been made. Yeah, he's, uh, he was very, very flat on that. Let me just repeat uh, what he said. He said Putin has made a decision. As of this moment, he's made a decision. Uh, there's reason to believe that. And then when he was pressed, are you convinced he is going to invade? The president of the United States said, yes, uh, he is convinced of that. Uh, uh, there's reason to believe an attack, he says, could come in the coming week, in the coming days. Matthew Chance uh, is in Kiev in the Ukrainian capital for us right now. Powerful words from the president. I'm sure it's going to startle all the folks where you are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've not heard, obviously, none of us have heard the U.S. president talk about it in such stark terms as that. He was even pressed by one of the reporters there uh, in the briefing room. How, how do you know he's made that decision? He said, because we've got considerable intelligence capability revealing there that they, or saying at least, that they have got an insight into what Vladimir Putin intends to do. And look, it, it's such a massive departure. Well, from the situation we were in, you know, just a few minutes ago, or in the, or just six months ago, or just last week, you know, we've been talking for that whole period about the build-up of tens of thousands of troops by Russia near the borders of Ukraine. We've been talking about how Russia poses a 
you know, a real threat or, or gives the impression of posing a threat. But right up until the 11th hour, the 59th minute of the 11th hour, as we keep on saying, you know, Vladimir Putin can decide whether or not to pull the trigger uh, on an invasion. What the President of the United States is now saying is that he believes that decision at the Kremlin to invade Ukraine has actually been taken by Vladimir Putin. I've already reached out uh, to my contacts at the Kremlin to see what reaction they've got. They haven't got back to me yet, but when they do, I'm going to bring it right to you. And it's, it's the they can do. You know, if they've been vaccinated, they've been boosted, they're ready to travel. They don't want to stay home anymore. The recent loosening of restrictions in several European countries has refueled interest to travel abroad. Here's correspondent Martha Raditz, who's traveling. She's in the region in Poland. She interviewed the Defense Secretary Austin today, who is visiting with U.S. troops. We know there is a huge presence of U.S. troops throughout the region. Uh, the Biden administration, administration making it very clear that U.S. forces will not be going into Ukraine, but they there they are there in the surrounding region as a show of force. Uh, and Martha, I know you did ask the Defense Secretary a question that I'm sure many people at home are asking. Is there any chance here that Vladimir Putin is bluffing? He said, absolutely not. This is no bluff. You cannot put that many troops around Ukraine and what those troops are doing. And they have medical supplies and nurses. And Lloyd Austin was a lifelong soldier before he was defense secretary. He said, as a soldier, you would never do those things unless you were going to take action. And we were sitting in a hangar. There were tanks in there. There were armored vehicles in there. And I said, can you imagine tanks like these rolling into Kiev if this happens? And he said, yes, I can. A very frightening picture. Sobering answer from Secretary Austin. Martha Raditz, who's right there along the western border in Poland. She will be in Ukraine uh, anchoring our coverage of ABC's This Week on Sunday morning. You'll have much more of her interview with Secretary uh, Austin then. Even before then, she'll be... Hosted by Eric Stone Street. Is becomes very clear when we hear that yesterday there have been the public. This doesn't require has been expected. They have been watching it very closely, and they feel that they are now in the final hours and days in which there is still a small possibility to try to get Putin to accept the off-ramp of diplomacy. But as you heard from President Biden, and it is extremely significant, what he just said in terms of, from his point of view, uh, Putin has already made a decision. That coincides with what I am hearing here at the Pentagon from Western intelligence sources, from Western allies. The, this is a very different situation than I've heard comparisons to the Iraq war and WMD and well, how do we know? We're seeing it with our own eyes. If you can't look at the kind of Iskander uh, uh, missile battalions that are now in Belarus, 30,000 Russian troops there, the kind, half of his uh, Air Force has now been deployed toward Ukraine. I am told in just moments ago from a senior defense official that 40 percent of his 190,000 troops who are on the border with Ukraine are now in attack positions. That is something that we have been waiting for. They were in those barracks. They are now moving into assault positions. They could move in a matter of hours or days. And this is something that needs to be watched closely. This is not some backwater. This is Europe. This is one of the largest military actions being threatened to redraw the map of Europe since World War II. It's going to be bloody. We've heard estimates that 50,000 civilians will be killed. One to five million refugees will be sent on the road. The level of destruction and the bloodiness of this uh, invasion, if it moves forward, and again, they are doing what they can to try and get uh, Lavrov and Blinken to meet and to say that if there's an invasion before that meeting on Wednesday, that, that then those sanctions and everything else goes into place and we're in a whole different world at that point. But right now, every American should be watching this and knowing that this is deadly serious. This is not some wag the dog situation. To even mention the Durham probe in the same 
sentences, what we just, what we know and what we can see with our own eyes in terms of the military buildup and knowing what Vladimir Putin is capable of. I served in Moscow from 1996 to 99. I watched as Vladimir Putin rose. I remember the apartment blocks that were blown up by his KGB, his FSB, as a pretext to go into Chechnya. Go look at those images of Chechnya and how carpet bombed Chechnya was when the Russian military moves in. This is not a precision, uh, small, pinpointed strike. This will be the full weight of the Russian military going into Ukraine if someone doesn't stop it in the coming days. Jennifer Griffin, thank you so much. We appreciate it. You look like you wanted to say something. Well, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, our electric grid in this country is balkanized. It's like a third world country. Even the military is connected to our electric grid. So we are very vulnerable to a cyber attack to the electric grid. It could throw us back. And I don't and I'm not being, you know, dramatic here, but it could throw us back into the dark ages. You mean terms, candlelight dinners? Yeah, candlelight dinners, but not romantic, may not, but not romantic with it. no food. OK, that's number one. Number two, if this invasion window is so obvious and we're in the right Right in the midst of it, why is the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, going to Munich this week? And why is he the most relaxed leader yeah. in the face of an invasion? Right. I've never seen a guy more well, relaxed. That was my point, but thank you very much <laughs> for finishing my sentence. World War II. Yeah, that's that's right, Ali. And and if President Biden's words come to pass, if Russia does invade and if they do go for the capital, Kiev, then it's going to be a large scale war. There's no way around that. It's going to involve heavy fighting. And if, if Russia is, is going full full bore for the capital, that certainly implies and suggests uh, an open ended occupation, uh, installing its own government. If it if it makes it to the capital, the potential for a large refugee outflow. In the past, U.S. officials have talked of a million or more potential refugees. Ukraine is a country of 44 million people, so you could certainly see big refugee outflows. Uh, the president warned there would be severe sanctions. There would be all sorts of economic repercussions uh, throughout Europe. So, um, no invasion has happened yet, but for the president to say that, and if that does come to pass, we're talking about a rip, ripple effects one after the other that would be quite extraordinary. Rick Stengel, you've had the advantage of being uh, uh, in, in, the, in government service and in uh, media, and I guess one of the questions that, that we have to ask is, is some people in media, generally speaking in right-wing media in the United States, have pointed out what is our obligation to uh, Ukraine and why do we care? It's not actually a NATO country, despite the fact that this conversation has turned into whether or not Ukraine should be allowed to join NATO at some point, but it's not. Uh, and the condition with NATO countries is if you attack one of them, it's considered an attack on all of them and everybody is compelled to, to each other's mutual defense. How, how does one argue how involved the United States gets uh, about an invasion of Russia into Ukraine? Well, Ali, Ukraine is a critical country. It has probably suffered more under the Russian boot than almost any other country in the world. And, and you've been showing that map. Ukraine is a hinge point between Russia and Western Europe, between the East and the West. That's why they're so important. That's why we have urged them to lean West uh, rather than lean east towards Moscow. What Putin wants is to make them dependent on Russia. He would like them, rather than invading them, to turn them into, into a failed state that would be dependent on Russia. We don't want that. That's not good for America. That's not good for the West. I want to just make one other point about the president's speech and, and our conversations about this. One of the things that the Biden administration has done differently than we did in the Obama administration is they look back at what at what happened during that annexation of 2014. And the Obama administration was a little bit taken aback on the heels. We weren't passive exactly, but we weren't calling things out. We didn't know about the extent of the Russian disinformation that was going on at the time, which we've learned since. One of the things that, that the Secretary of State has done, that the President has done, that the NSC has done, is they have gone out there and before Russia does something, they have done a kind of pre buttle to try to inoculate people against Russian disinformation and Russian false flags. That's essentially what the extraordinary thing is that President Biden just did there that, that Mike McFaul was talking about, where he said, look, we have intelligence saying that Russia will not only invade Ukraine, it will go all the way to Kyiv. 
This is the, this is the American way, the new way of getting ahead of disinformation, getting ahead of false flags, getting ahead of aggression with some idea that it can actually do, go some ways to prevent that from happening. It's being more aggressive about what we know than we used to be, and I really applaud that, and it, and it can have benefits. I hope it does this time. Mike McFall, I'm just keeping... ...prison to, when, to ask how we're treated. They come into the... Quite a moment to be in, quite a sobering moment to be in. You know, Jim, uh, you're there in Kiev, in, in the Ukrainian capital, earlier, about an hour or so before the president spoke, uh, the White House officials publicly, on the record, said they have confirmed it was Russia, the intelligence units in Russia, that launched these cyber attacks against Ukraine. Uh, the, the banks, uh, the defense ministry, other critically important institutions in Ukraine in recent days earlier was unclear who was responsible. They now say it was Russia, and they're also warning the Russians could launch further attacks uh, as well as going after locations here in the U.S. What, what's the reaction there? I'm not sure that Jim Shudo heard us, uh, but we're going to continue to follow this because this element, this element of uh, cyber warfare is exploding right now, and there's enormous fear at the White House, the Defense Department, the CIA, that it's about to get so much worse. Everybody stand by. We're following all the breaking news. Very, very strong words from the President of the United States. Also, another major story we're following, breaking news, the National Archives now confirming that it has found classified documents and boxes of former President Trump's records at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida. Plus, former police officer Kim Potter sentenced for the killing of Dante Wright. We're standing by for more reaction from the family. Oh, that means it's inappropriate. But it's a fresh audience. I love it. Your time starts now. This is a game that we're not... Female leader of Russia, she never would have invaded. So, Leslie, right? it's all about men, right? <laughs> it's all about the gorillas. Since the beginning of time, it's well, been men. You know what? We're on the pink team over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good thing we said Kamala over there. Can you name a woman? Yeah. Yeah. Can you name a woman that's had a... A former Minnesota police officer, Kim Potter, sentenced today to two years in prison for the death of Dante Wright. Potter mistook her gun for a taser during this traffic stop and shot the 20-year-old black man last April as he tried to drive away. Now, the judge delivering the sentence after hearing from Wright's family as well as Potter. And correspondent Kelly Beeson has been following this trial, joins us live to recap what sounds like, Kelly, an emotional day in the courtroom. Yeah, certainly an emotional day, Nicole, and that emotion not only from those involved in this case, but also from the judge. Potter was convicted in December of first degree and second degree manslaughter in the April 11th killing of 20-year-old Dante Wright. She was sentenced only on the more serious charge in accordance with state law. It is the sentence and judgment of this court that you shall be committed to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 24 months. Former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter receiving her prison sentence today. The news coming from a judge who called the trial one of the saddest cases she's had in her two decades on the bench. Officer Potter made a mistake that ended tragically. She never intended to hurt anyone. Last year on April 11th, Potter pulled over 20-year-old Dante Wright and attempted to place him under arrest for an outstanding warrant. When he resisted, she fatally shot him, saying she meant to use her taser, but accidentally grabbed her gun instead. Before sentencing, Potter offered an apology to Wright's family and then spoke directly to his mother. Katie, I understand a mother's love, and I am sorry I broke your heart. My heart is broken for all of you. Kim Potter murdered my son, and he died April 11th. Today, the justice system murdered him all over again. Wright's family denounced the verdict as too lenient, adding the judge gave more consideration to the white officer than the black victim. This is 
the problem with our justice system today. White women tears trumps. Wow. Trumps justice. And I thought my white women tears would be good enough because they're true and genuine. Now, Potter had been on the police force for 26 years. 16 months of her sentence will be spent in prison, and a third will be on supervised release. She's also earned credit for 58 days already served. Nicole. Yeah, such a powerful statement from Dante Wright's mother there. Kelly, what was the judge's reasoning for the lesser sentence? We know the recommended time behind bars for that charge. First degree manslaughter, it's six to eight and a half years behind bars. Well, the judge in this case said the lesser sentence was warranted because Potter was, quote, in the line of duty and doing her job and attempting to lawfully arrest Dante Wright, adding that Potter was trying to protect another officer who could have been dragged and seriously injured if Wright drove away. Nicole. All right. Kelly, thank you for that. A massive cargo ship carrying thousands of luxury cars up in countries but it's a there's a there are conflicts there are internal conflicts when we go over there they say you can't even understand what it's like to live next to russia and to have this mixture of, of ethnic russians and and people who speak the russian language so it is complicated but again i feel and i think everybody on this call would agree that all of those countries want to lean west they want to have the independence to choose their own leaders and not be forced to do the bidding of an autocrat in Moscow. Greg Myrie, I'm going to ask my control room to put up, if we can, we've got two different maps. One is uh, NATO as it looked in 1978 and NATO as it looks now. Uh, this was 1978. You can see the bright green countries are NATO, red is Russia, orange is Ukraine, and everything else is an independent, non-aligned country. Now take a look at what NATO looks like today. A whole bunch of those countries are filled in. Vladimir Putin, Greg, makes the argument that somehow the West and NATO and the EU kind of stole those countries from uh, under Russian influence. Most people would say those countries, as, as Rick just said and as, as Ambassador McFall has said, made the decision when they had the opportunity to face West and to do that. Ukraine has struggled with that over the last 20 years. They have had fits and starts of deciding which way they want to face. But the bottom line is... Most countries should have the right to make that determination for themselves. Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to feel that for Ukraine. Right. In, in Putin's view, large countries control and dominate smaller countries in their neighborhood. But NATO has this famously open door policy. All those countries are democracies that have freely chosen to join NATO. Nobody forced them into NATO. Somebody made the point that the, the old Warsaw Pact, the, the countries that the in the Soviet sphere of influence, was the only pact w where they were invaded uh, by their own members. Or Russia invaded some of the countries that were in <laughs> the Warsaw Pact, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Um, these are countries that chose freely to be in NATO. Uh, three of the former Soviet republics, the Baltics chose to be in NATO. And, and Putin talks a lot about reconstituting, well, the, the notion that he would like to reconstitute the, the Soviet Union, but, but three countries in the Baltics have joined NATO. Three other countries have Russian troops that they don't want. Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia uh, have all had Russian troops come onto their territory against their will. So th these are, this is not uh, um, moves of choice. Putin sees it as the large countries should, should have this sphere of influence and dominate their neighborhood. But you look at the way these countries have made choices over the past decades, and it has been toward the West and away from Moscow. Up and burning the pubic hair with it. P program statement. And that would be obviously um, very convenient for the Russians to do and part of their plan anyway. Because the Russians would say he's escaped, uh, he's trying to save himself, so he's left Ukraine, headed off to Munich, uh, and that would be an opportunity for them. Congressman Christian Murthy, uh, as usual, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Up next, uh, more breaking news. The National Archives confirming it found classified documents and boxes it retrieved from Mar-a-Lago last month. Is the former president of the United States now in legal jeopardy? I'm the delights and do it. I want to. Why would you like? He's going inside of my bunker.
the edge a little bit, but he didn't do that. He went full Mao on them. And, and now look what we have. We have a whole country of people at each other's throats. And where's Bieber? Right? He's the most yeah. famous Canadian <laughs> out there. He hasn't said a word about this. Well, you know, Greg, as we talked about <laughs> yesterday, you've got... That's what Justin, everybody's asking. You've got Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau counter to what our founding fathers actually envisioned is because after especially after world war one and world war two we said my god we have to stop these global wars the only way we could come up with to stop them was by having a strong enough military where if we threatened anyone who was going to go to war with one another or with us that we would intervene we could stop war and by and large on the global level we have stopped global wars but that's really what's at stake here now if putin continues we may see this become a much nastier situation to include even by accident or on purpose if he attacks a NATO ally, a global war. So it's really dangerous. I invited you all on for a relatively short conversation, which became an hour and a half long conversation. So I'm grateful to you all uh, and your expertise in this really important moment for us. Evelyn Farkas, Ambassador Michael McFall, Rick Stengel, and Greg Myrie, thanks to all of you for being here. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to continue monitoring this breaking development that uh, Joe Biden says he's convinced Vladimir Putin has made a decision to invade Ukraine. We'll go live to Moscow. Plus, the other headline we told you about earlier, material taken from Trump's White House did, in fact, include classified national security documents. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the lunch from Mexico, but has lived in Nogales, Arizona for the last 55 years. He's been here long before the border fence was added, which happened in the last few years, further separating the two cities. La abuelita de mi esposa. Governments make walls. I remember my wife's grandmother uh, used to live over there and come over here to work in a store. And uh, she got real sad when they started building the wall. I say, well, people are going to come anyway, so why build walls? You look through the fence, you see children playing in the schoolyards across the street. You look up, and the razor wire takes away some of that innocence. This passerby from Canada was taken aback. I think it's a little carried away, personally. Or is it? Keep in mind, Nogales, Mexico is over 10 times the size of its American counterpart, but the local newspaper on the Mexican side reported 365 murders in 2021. 2019 numbers from the FBI, the latest publicly available, show Nogales, Arizona, at zero. The crime does spill over. This area is notorious for tunnels dug under the border to sneak drugs across, like this one discovered in 2020. And that's why Castro thinks the wall is unnecessary. He pegs the problems on a couple of bad actors who will continue to be bad and believes it doesn't represent the city he's called home for over five decades. Nogales, Arizona. I think the two Nogales uh, have a, an underserved bad reputation. Sure, there were some shootings on the other side uh, and some violence, but that was in the past. Now I think uh, both cities are very peaceful. And you go to Tijuana across from San Diego, Juarez across from El Paso, similar stories out there. One thing we've heard from law enforcement is that in order to really put a dent in the cross-border crime, they really need more cooperation from the Mexican government. As it so happens, the president of Mexico is on a border tour this week. One of the cities he's visiting, Nogales, Mexico. Nicole? All right, Robert Sherman live. The track of the system, if it changes just a few miles north or south, it's going to affect people in a different way. So just know that on Monday into Tuesday, it's going to be not so great around here. Certainly. And this is, again, one computer model. You can see the heavy snow kind of right through us, essentially. The yeah, the 8 to 12 is just a north, like along and north of Interstate 90. And some places where you see that darker shade of pink there, maybe a foot or more. And then this one is actually keeping it, I think, a little bit further to the north. Yeah. And see, like, like coming to the Sioux Falls area, you're looking at maybe about three to five inches. So again, yeah. the track of this is going to be very key. And of course, once we get the new model runs tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, and Sunday, we should have a kind of a better idea of what we can see. And, you know, and just whether you get, you know, three inches or six or seven inches, it's not going to be great out there. So uh, it's going to be windy. It's going to be snowy. Travel is going to be tough. So uh, again, that's what you need to expect as we head into Monday into Tuesday as well. That storm's still going to be sticking around. Look at that big drop off from Sunday into Monday from 50 to 20 and then only <laughs> single digits for highs for a few days. And we'll try to warm things up as we head into the end of our 10 day forecast. And that's going to be the concern too with that blowing snow because it's not going to be that wet, heavy snow either. It's going to be right. kind of that light, fluffy snow as Which well. Which is easy to blow around. Certainly. But anyway, stay with us. We'll have more Dakota news now when we come back.
any supplies into local drugstores or Walgreens, uh, that we need more truckers. We need them. It's yeah. tough jobs. Yeah, so it's just yeah. 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 So by the way, yeah, yeah. this after convoy has affected the supply chain on both sides yeah. of the border. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then that's maybe after... if, if the prime minister had acted rationally and in good faith, like Jesse's recommendation is actually the best one I've heard. Suspend the mandates for Smartest two weeks. Man in <laughs> <laughs> Hammer everything out. And then once you have an agreement, uh, then commerce it will be free flowing, uh, not only from the moment you actually sit down, but until there is a resolution. Justin Trudeau is an embarrassment to the Northern Hemisphere, and he should be <laughs> and, kicked out of. And humanity. to all those people who <laughs> add to their eyebrows because his are falling off. All Destroy classified information. If it was done not by accident, but if it was done intentionally and knowingly, if, as reported, these documents were marked classified, then anyone who could read would know they were classified. And if there is proof after an investigation that it was done intentionally, then you have a potential crime. Yes, a sitting president can declassify documents. No, a former president cannot retroactively declassify. If Donald Trump did declassify these documents while he was president, presumably there would be some witness or some record to reflect that. In the absence of that, we could be in criminal territory That's here. a good point, a very important point. Uh, Andrew, the archives also confirmed today that the former president continued to tear up documents after being told not to do so. Uh, do you see this potentially as further evidence that he didn't think the rules actually apply to him? Well, I think it's undeniable evidence of that. Well, if we know this president had all kinds of problems handling sensitive and classified information. He took a highly classified uh, satellite imagery and put it out on his, on his Twitter feed. He exposed highly sensitive intelligence that we had from a foreign government to a different foreign government. So this is not the first time we've seen the former president uh, play fast and loose with the rules around national security. And, you know, in my opinion, it indicates a persistent disregard for national security. These rules are in place for a reason. It's to protect all of us, and it's incumbent upon the president to do that. You know, Ellie, a federal judge just ruled that a civil lawsuit seeking to hold Trump accountable for January 6th can, in fact, move forward. How significant is it to see a judge rule that a president can be sued, a former president, for something that happened uh, while he was actually in office on January 6th? Well, Wolf, that's significant as a legal doctrine, the notion that a former president can be sued for something that arguably touched on the office. I think I would argue that it went well beyond his presidential duties. But it's also an important statement by this judge of President Trump's or former President Trump's potential responsibility for, uh, for the January 6th attack. And more importantly, it keeps Donald Trump in this case, meaning the next phase here is discovery, where you gather documents, where he could be subject to depositions and other testimony under oath. So we'll see what comes out of that. Ellie Honig, Andrew McCabe, uh, gentlemen, thank you very well. much. Just ahead, a very emotional day in court for the sentencing of Kim Potter, the former Minnesota police officer who killed Dante Wright, uh, why the Wright family says they feel cheated and hurt by the judge's sentence. Verizon is going you and the rest of your family. The two-year sentence was well below the punishment the prosecutors were looking for. Wright's family has expressed anger over the sentencing. His mother saying today, quote, the justice system murdered him all over again. A consumer alert here at 4 o'clock. The FDA warning parents to double-check labels if they're using powdered infant formula. The popular powdered brands at issue are from Abbott Nutrition. Products labeled Similac, Elementum, and Elicare may be contaminated. There have been reports of four infants hospitalized and one death in three states. The FDA says a parent should avoid using the formula if the first two digits on the infant formula's code are between 22 and 37, and if the expiration date is April 2022 or later. Be sure to visit FDA.gov for more details. All members of Congress invited to attend President Biden's State of the Union in person. The House Sergeant at Arms says that the March 1st speech will be returned to a full chamber after limited attendance last year. All 535 members of Congress, Supreme Court justices, administration staff, guests and members of the press will be invited. Attendees must wear a mask and have a negative COVID-19 test. A vaccine booster shot is also recommended but not required. Going to require ourselves to get those snowblowers out once we get this next system. And, you know, as of now, we kind of felt that change up. Phil talked about it 
what, <laughs> feeling that cold gust of air at about 3 o'clock today, and that stuff's already coming. Sometimes you can kind of tell, like, when a front comes through, whether mm -hmm. it warms up really quickly or it, the temperature drops really quickly. You know, and this was the case today um, with the temperatures kind of dropping, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, really, really quickly, but you're noticing a, a general decline in those temperatures and that front has actually produced a little bit of some flurries and drizzle uh, throughout the day today. But again, nothing accumulation worthy, but that's going to come later in the uh, coming days. We'll talk about that coming up right now in Sioux Falls. It's 33 degrees. It is cloudy. The wind sustained at 31 miles an hour out of the north and northwest in Aberdeen. We've had a few clouds. That's oh, you're welcome. And that's not all pilot is also. What are you going to do? Thank you and God bless. Two, uh, and then you know, even Putin's comment that he was going to de-escalate a few days ago, inevitably he would seek to do that uh, before launching a pretext for a potential invasion. And it was always going to be the case that we'd be entering a really intense period, as the Biden administration has warned, where they would use those conflict regions in eastern Ukraine uh, to propagate a theory that they've done before. This was the kind of pretext they used in Georgia in 2008 and Crimea in 2014, that Russians were somehow threatened, ethnic Russians, with genocidal violence. Uh, and then, you know, whipping his own uh, media into a frenzy and his own information warfare systems into a frenzy, combined with cyber attacks, that, that's always the last stage before we see a more significant military movement, and it, it certainly feels like we've derived at that juncture. Is there any, um, is there any strategy in what uh, Joe Biden would have said? Uh, he didn't say it um, loosely, and he reiterated what he said, but is there a strategy in signaling to Russia, we have intelligence that you have made a decision, um, and that has upped the ante? I think the strategy people have to keep in mind, it's, it's not just the Russian audience, and it's not just the audience of Putin. Uh, I do think they've, I'm sure, signaled that they would continue to want to pursue diplomacy, want to continue to explore off-ramps to this very apparent escalation. But part of the reason why President Biden and his administration have been so adamant in making clear that President Putin would be the aggressor in this circumstance is precisely because they anticipated the kind of false pretext that we've seen today from the Russians. And one way to try to win that battle for global public opinion, one way to hold together the alliance, uh, our NATO allies, the countries that we need to be with us on sanctions, is to continue to be this forthright about what we know in terms of pinning the blame for this where, frankly, it rests, which is with the decision of Vladimir Putin. That's the pretext for Biden uh, of all of the responses that the United States will try to lead when it comes to sanctions and diplomatic isolation going forward. So I think it's not just Putin that he's trying uh, to obviously deny that information dominance. It's, it's the audience that he's trying to reach globally uh, and the message that this is going to be entirely Russia's responsibility no matter what you hear out of Moscow in the coming hours and days. Ben, uh, always good to talk to you. Thank you for your uh, important analysis here. Ben Rhodes, uh, I want to bring in uh, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman now. He's the former director for European Affairs at the National Security Council. He is an expert on Eastern Europe and Russia um, and, and uh, hails from that part of the world as well. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you for joining us. You heard what President Biden had said, that Vladimir Putin has made a decision to invade Ukraine. I, I want to get your analysis of this situation yeah unfortunately that seemed pretty clear over the past 24 hours that uh, all the remaining indicators that uh, Vladimir Putin had made the decision had kind of fallen into place the the massive uptick in the uh, propaganda campaign and setting the inter information environment the pretexts uh, coming together this this idea that the Ukrainians were somehow driving this and then, of course, the obligatory uh, saber, nuclear saber rattling, the, this doctrine that the Russians have developed that's supposed to warn off, deter uh, adversaries from, you know, considering their own involvement. Uh, the problem with with all this is that, frankly, the Biden administration was pretty crystal clear about the fact that it has no interest in in, in uh, moving towards a bilateral confrontation. So the purpose of this these uh, nuclear drills were, you know, just kind of another tick tick mark, another check, uh, checkbox that. The decision's been made, uh, the, the war is coming. It's a pretty sad day. 
Uh, you brought up the, the nuclear matter, and, and the president did indicate that he did not believe that there was going to be a nuclear component to this. This is, of course, important because America is nuclear armed, Russia is nuclear armed, and there are lots of other nuclear armed countries around the world. C can you tell me a little bit about that? Why, why is that? Why does, why does our intelligence believe that there's no nuclear threat here? Well, I think, uh, frankly, there aren't that many nuclear powers. At least uh, there are only two nuclear powers that could uh, annihilate the, the whole globe, and that's Russia and the U.S. And the, the, the Russians have this doc doctrine called reflexive control, where they kind of key in on a couple of different activities, uh, changing the alert posture, posture conducting these large-scale exercises. And the whole idea is that they're supposed to warn off the U.S. and get the U.S. to, to, to back down, get uh, adversaries to back down, on the risk that somehow this turns into a nuclear confrontation. The reality is that there is zero interest from the Russians to move in that direction. All they're doing is saber rattling to, to get the U.S. to go to the worst case scenario and avoid taking costly actions or imposing a costly measure, measures against Ukraine, correction, costly measures against Russia. But they have no interest because they would also lose. It's called mutually assured destruction. It's what kept us out of a nuclear war during the entirety of the Cold War. But they also have zero interest in a conventional confrontation. That's something that most Americans don't realize, is that the Russians are deathly afraid. I sat in the room when senior military uh, policymakers, senior, senior military leaders sat eye to eye and were discussing these issues. I was in the room when the U.S. Uh, was striking uh, bases in Syria, translating the phone calls. And you could hear the kind of the, the, the fear and the voice uh, uh, on that side of the phone call that they really did not want to move towards a bilateral confrontation. So we should just kind of recognize that this is not going to become bilateral unless we stumble into it. Every, most ask. parties are taking steps to avoid that. But now that shots are about to get fired, that's where, where the dangers start to increase uh, because it becomes extremely unpredictable. Let me ask you about the things that are happening on the eastern border. There are, there are some Russian separatists. There are people on the Ukrainian side of the border with Russia who are armed, uh, who are taking some action. Since 2014, it's been confusing sometimes as to who is whom. They used to refer to those little green men that had no insignia. What's your signal? What's the signal to you that an invasion is underway? Because for the last 24 hours, we've heard about skirmishes, bombs. We've seen video. We've seen unusual things that, um, you know, if they were happening between Canada and the United States, you'd think something very serious yep. is happening. How do you read what's happening there and where we are with respect to the sure. beginning of an invasion? We, we could be at what, what we call in the military D-1. So deployment day or D-Day uh, is the day that the, that the actual shots are fired in a meaningful way. But today is the shaping operations. Today are, uh, you know, what you could see and today's maybe a little bit subjective. That could be today, tomorrow. But we're we're in that shaping phase where cyber operations are starting to unfold. They're they're intended to degrade military command and control. They're uh, de intended to degrade telecommunications. They're, they're intended to degrade critical infrastructure. We will also start seeing in this shaping phase, you know, D minus one, probably some sabotage operations, other kinds of activities to uh, interfere with uh, the good order and a function of government and the good order and function of the military. We will not miss when, sh when we're in D-Day. D-Day will look very, very different than D-1. D-Day will be a, a, an extremely powerful strike by Russia. This, they will uh, eliminate the, what, what little air force the Ukraine has. They will eliminate the entirety of the, the naval forces that, that Ukraine has. They will destroy uh, command and control nodes they'll go after political targets. They, we will not miss it. It will look very much like a shock and awe campaign. And once the uh, Russians believe they've achieved their effects there in, the, in those uh, you know, early days, then th that's when they'll follow through with uh, long range artillery and uh, start ground maneuver. So and, that and we will not be back. It's gonna be enormous. The president, uh, Biden, uh, alluded to the fact that they'd go for the whole country. They'd go for, for Kiev, which is not the whole country. It's, it's halfway yeah. across the country. But the point is, once you've decided you've taken the capital, this is not an incursion into areas that you feel need protection because there are uh, large Russian-speaking ethnic minorities. What do you make of that, the idea that this could be a full-scale invasion of the nation, the independent nation of Ukraine? Well, so this, you know, this goes uh, and dispenses with, uh, this argument of, Somehow, it's uh, because of the way the Ukrainians have been treating the, 
the Russian speaking population, which, you know, they've been they've actually happier in uh, in uh, Ukraine than they are in Russia. And it also dispenses with this idea that this has something to do with NATO. This has always been about changing the course of Ukraine away from a Western trajectory that has been on for, for 15 years, very, very concerted, uh, of course, since 2014, and back towards Russia. So what they really, the operation for Kiev is mainly designed to uh, change the political leadership. Uh, they may not, they don't, they probably don't need it to uh, take the entire country. It's unlikely that they have the, uh, the entire, uh, the combat power to take the whole country, but they can huh. topple the government in, in Kiev. They can seize ci cities. They could seize ports, the big, uh, major port on, on um, the Black Sea, Odessa, and they could force the, a change in the, the direction of the country. That's what they're going for. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, troops are going to go all the way towards Romania, Hungary, and Poland. Uh, on the western portions of um, of Ukraine, but they will change the government. That's what they're going to try to do. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, we appreciate your time and your analysis. It's going to become increasingly important as we get toward that uh, invasion that we're all hoping and praying doesn't happen. All right, when we come back, a congressional committee asking the Justice Department to find out how Donald Trump managed to take classified documents to Mar-a-Lago after leaving the White House. That story's next. If you have the bipolar one, ask about Vraylar. Pampers. Wrap. It's weather when you can afford. Select quote. Actually, and uh, we were talking about women going to prison because of opioid addiction. I got that price. Something tells me I know what I'm going to get for Christmas. Tonight on MeTV, it's the Adams Family, followed by Happy Days and MASH. That's on the way on MeTV. Attention, a common herbicide. Recent lead to drastic changes in women's figure skating. Winter storm mess near whiteout conditions result in a 100 vehicle pileup in Illinois. And on the road to a Florida school with an unlikely visitor. Family outraged. Tonight, the pandemic and the new headline how many Americans are believed to have some sort of immunity when it comes to COVID now? Breaking news involving former President Trump, the National Archives tonight in a letter to Congress on those 15 boxes of White House records recovered from Mar-a-Lago, now saying the boxes did in fact contain classified documents, including national security information. John Carl is standing by live. North of the border tonight, the arrests, Canadian police moving in, taking on those who were protesting what our team witnessed. And miles of Ukraine's border where they've deployed helicopter and ground attack aircraft. Meanwhile, Russian-backed separatists have announced the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of residents to Russia from a region in eastern Ukraine. Russian media is also reporting attacks in the region that the U.S. and Ukraine say are staged false flag attacks. Russia has increased its number of troops to the border to as many as 190,000. We have a lot of news to get to tonight with this fast-moving story, but we begin first with CBS's Weijia Jiang at the White House, where the president made that extraordinary announcement. Good evening, Weijia. Good evening, Jerika. For weeks now, President Biden has said the U.S. was not positive that Vladimir Putin had decided to invade Ukraine. Well, that all changed today as he warned it would likely happen in the coming days. The president vowed to implement punishing sanctions to make Russia pay the price, but he also said Putin still had time to change his mind. For the first time, President Biden left no room Today. for doubt over whether he believes Vladimir Putin will launch an invasion of Ukraine. You are convinced that President Putin is going to invade Ukraine. Is that what you just said a few moments yes, ago? Yes, I did. Yes. So is diplomacy off the table then? No, 
is all until he does, diplomacy is always a possibility. The president revealed his assessment after holding a phone call with NATO allies amid the administration's all-out effort to prevent a war. He said there was reason to believe Russia would invade in the coming days. We're doing everything in our power to remove any reason that Russia may give to justify invading Ukraine and prevent them from moving. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Vice President Kamala Harris are meeting with allies at a security conference in Munich. She is scheduled to see Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Saturday. But some U.S. officials worry him leaving Ukraine would give Moscow a window to act. Tonight, the White House is also blaming Russia for those cyber attacks in Ukraine that we saw this week against the defense ministry and major banks. National security officials say they do not have intelligence to indicate Russia is coming after the U.S. next, but they are working with the private sector to secure systems just in case. Jerika? We did Jang at the White House getting the president to clarify how seriously concerned he is about an invasion. Thank you. Now to Ukraine, where in the eastern part of the country, there there have been reports of explosions along with air raid sirens. CBS's Charlie Daggett is in the city of Kyiv with the very latest. Good evening, Charlie. Good evening, Jerika. There has been a dramatic rise in tensions here in the last 48 hours due largely to those developments in the east. Exactly the kind of move the U.S. and NATO allies have feared Moscow might use as a pretext to invade. Women, children, and the elderly packed onto buses in eastern Ukraine tonight, part of a mass evacuation of citizens headed to Russia, they were told, for their own safety. Sirens blared with Russian-backed rebels who controlled the region, warning that Ukrainian forces are about to attack. Also circulated today, video of what's left of a jeep rebels say blew up outside their headquarters in Donetsk. The region is not only controlled by Russian-backed separatists, but so are the images and information that come out of it. Russian media tonight also showed this video described as an explosion affecting a pipeline in a rebel-held city. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense flatly denied claims they're planning aggressions and warned against false flag operations meant to trigger a war. Today's events follow a dramatic escalation in hostilities between Ukrainian government forces and Russian separatists in the east, including shelling that tore through the walls of a kindergarten in Ukraine yesterday. President Vladimir Putin blamed Ukraine for the deteriorating security situation. And ratcheting tensions even higher. Moscow's plans to hold nuclear exercises on Saturday to test ballistic and cruise missiles that President Putin himself will personally supervise. U.S. officials now say Russia has amassed as many as 190,000 troops near the border of Ukraine, an increase from around 100,000 at the end of January. Edging even closer and awaiting further orders. Now, those military exercises to one side, the real concern here this weekend would be whether we see further escalations in eastern Ukraine and what that potential flashpoint may bring. Jerika? Charlie, thank you. Let's turn now to CBS's chief foreign affairs correspondent and moderator of Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan. Margaret, you've been covering this for weeks now. It's clear that things have escalated. What are some of the broader implications here? Well, the U.S., Jerika, is concerned that other autocratic countries like China may take a page out of Vladimir Putin's playbook. And the president said this would be a catastrophic war of choice. And it goes beyond Ukraine. As he describes it, he believes Vladimir Putin wants to reshape Europe and the global power alliance that has existed for the past 77 years. And in many ways, this is personal for President Biden. It was on his watch back in 2014 when he was president that he ran Ukraine policy and that's when Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea part of southern Ukraine and fed the fighting in the east of the country uh, and he didn't pay a large price for that so the concern now is Vladimir Putin may not stop there what happens next will definitely impact the global economy it could potentially create millions of refugees and it could possibly cost thousands of lives Wow, very, very disturbing. Margaret Brennan for us, thank you.
It was sentencing day for a former Minnesota police officer found guilty of manslaughter in the shooting death of 20-year-old Dante Wright. David Schumann from our Minneapolis station WCCO was inside the courthouse. I have to live in this nightmare watching my son shot and killed over and over again. Through tears, Katie Wright pleaded for the former police officer Kim Potter to get the maximum sentence for killing her son. She never once said his name. And for that, I'll never be able to forgive you. Potter, who had been on the force for 26 years, was convicted of first-degree manslaughter two days before Christmas. Potter says she meant to tase Wright during a traffic stop last April. I just shot him. I grabbed the wrong gun. But pulled her gun instead, shooting Wright once in the chest. When her time to speak came, a tearful Potter looked directly at Wright's mother. I understand a mother's love, and I am sorry I broke your heart. Officer Potter made a mistake that ended tragically. In the end, Judge Regina Chu, her voice cracking, said Potter would serve 24 months, a quarter of what she faced. She never intended to hurt anyone. Wright's family disappointed with the sentence. This lady got a slap on the wrist, and we still every night sitting around crying, waiting on my son to come home. Under Minnesota law, Potter will only have to serve two-thirds of her sentence in prison, 16 months, which means she could be released almost exactly two years after Dante Wright's death. Jerika? David Schumann for us. Thank you. Tonight, the entire family of America's top doctor is fighting COVID. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy revealed his four-year-old daughter's diagnosis a few days ago. Well, now Murthy, his wife, and five-year-old son have all tested positive. We turn now to the hidden toll of the two-year pandemic on exhausted health care workers. Here's CBS's Chris Van Cleve. Those are all COVID patient rooms. Nurse Courtney Hollingsworth takes us inside the COVID surge unit at St. Clair Regional Medical Center in rural Moorhead, Kentucky. Some of these people are very, very sick. Hollingsworth estimates about 40% of the nursing staff here has left during the pandemic. Burnout and what she calls compassion fatigue are now just part of the job. We're reminding ourselves why we went in to nursing where we make a difference. The hospital says about 90% of COVID patients who end up here are unvaccinated. The staff says much of this community seems to have moved on from the pandemic, while its life and death consequences play out inside the hospital walls around the clock. The only thing that is semi-comparable and not even, not even close is like a battlefield. And we've been fighting now for two years, but we're the only people left to fight. Do you think about walking away? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the appropriate thing to do. I feel like I would be abandoning my, my friends, my family. Aaron Parker Banks has been the only doctor on that battlefield at this family clinic in Owingsville, 50 miles east of Lexington. At any moment, if I start thinking about it, I cry. One of my mentors growing up who was like a mom to me, she lost her battle. There's not even words that can describe what all we've seen over the last year and a half. He says finding those words and his own time to heal will have to wait for now. Chris Van Cleve, CBS News, Owingsville, Kentucky. Now to some other stories. Uh, as usual, for joining us, uh, as you heard, the, and as you well know, the Wright family is clearly dissatisfied with his two-year sentence for Kim Potter. What, what, what went through your mind, Ben, uh, when you got the news? You know, Wolf, the Wright family has every reason to be dissatisfied, as many uh, minorities, especially African Americans around the country today, because, again, we see there are two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America. Wolf, the judge, actually said, and I, I almost fell out my seat when she said that, try to put yourself in the shoes of Kim Potter, this white police woman who had just killed this young man over a traffic stop. I have never in my entire career heard any judge ever say when a black person was convicted. And we have to remember, Kim Potter had been convicted by a jury of her peers 
in Hennepin County, Minnesota, there in Minneapolis. And she then said, put yourself in her shoes. They have never said that about a convicted black person in America, ask citizens to put themselves in their shoes. I, I was offended, not just as a civil rights lawyer, but as an African American. I also want to turn, Ben, uh, to this uh, mall fight in New Jersey. Uh, uh, let, let's watch the video showing a black teenager who you are now representing getting very, very different treatment from the police than the white teenager who was also involved. Just watch this for a moment. No, 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 bro. Chill. Chill. Brian, get up. Brian, 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 leave. black teenager was wrestled to the ground, handcuffed, the police on his back. The white teenager, they let him sit on the couch over there. Tell us why this all caught your personal attention. Because, Wolf, it seems to be a double standard again at play, just like with the sentencing of Officer Kim Potter, where we have black people sitting in prisons for selling marijuana, and they got greater time in prison than this white policewoman for killing a young black man. It just seems to be a double standard all the way around. And when you look at this video of Zakai, this young black kid being put face down, a knee in his back, and handcuffed because he was presumed guilty, and the young man who was white was presumed innocent, it tells you why we have the system that we have today with so many black men incarcerated disproportionately to the population. And if we sweep this under the rug, Wolf Blitzer, then these matters turn into Trayvon Martins. It turn into Ahmaud Arbery. So right now in America, whether in Minneapolis or New Jersey, what black people are seeing is anything but equal justice. When we look at uh, the, the many cases that you've been involved in uh, over these past few years, from rights killing uh, to the small fight, a, a very clear, as you correctly point out, disturbing picture uh, of policing in America emerges. Do you see, uh, do you see any real progress being made? Well, obviously, we had the uh, convictions of Derek Chauvin for killing George Floyd and uh, the lynch mob for lynching Ahmaud Arbery for jogging while black. But there's so much work we have to do as we come up on the 10-year remembrance of Trayvon Martin next week of how far we're going to get racial justice in America. And I hope that President Obama will pass an, I'm sorry, President Biden will pass an executive order to address this on a national level. Attorney Ben Crump, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, uh, the U.S. Surgeon General reveals that even his strict adherence to COVID precautions didn't prevent him from getting infected. Much warmer west. Then the story is going to be a cold front coming through on Sunday. So we're going to see a drop in temperatures again. And we're going to be watching our next potential for a little bit of snow as well. The storm system we've been talking about. So this model is keeping a lot of the heavier snow through Monday morning north of Mitchell, north of Sioux Falls. And even into the afternoon hours. But eventually we'll get our share of snow in the southeastern parts of the area Monday evening into Tuesday morning, according to this model run, and then it moves quickly out of the area by Tuesday, but then we may have a little bit of some redevelopment just down to our south heading into Wednesday. So how much President Trump took with him when he left the White House included, quote, items marked as classified national security information. The head of the archives said that when the sensitive material was discovered, he informed the Justice Department. Mishandling classified information is against the law. For years, Trump repeatedly attacked Hillary Clinton for mishandling her official records, specifically her emails, while she was Secretary of State. The thing that you should be apologizing for are the 33,000 emails that you deleted, and then the two boxes of emails and other things last week that were taken from an office and are now missing. He and other Republicans hammered Clinton for using a private email account to conduct official business. But it turns out, that was also happening in the Trump White House. In the letter today, the archives said, quote, some White House staff conducted official business using non-official electronic messaging accounts. 
Those records were not turned over to the archives as required by law, but the archives said they are now in the process of obtaining them. In another setback for Trump, a judge today ruled that lawsuits against him for injuries sustained on January 6th could go forward. The judge saying a plausible case could be made that Trump knowingly provoked those who attacked the Capitol. David? All right, John Carl tonight. John, thank you. When we come back tonight, the images coming in, the passenger planes struggling to land in 70 mile per hour winds. I've made progress with my mental health. Get it. That's why I always tell people, you know, like until you step inside the white lines, you just, yeah. you know, in an NFL game, you just, you'll never know. I mean, and to get in that car, and even though they wouldn't let me go the speeds that they went, I was just like, all right, all right, yeah. I, uh, I learned my lesson. You don't, you don't speak about something you know nothing about, and that was clearly one of those. <laughs> I do that every night, Merrill. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we've had a lot of guests on talking about CTE, and I was fascinating re reading about your, your, your background, I mean, beyond football, um, how much you've done. And the book you wrote caught my attention. Um, the subtitle there especially, bad, The Bad Science Behind CTE and the Plot to Destroy Football. Do you, do you think this isn't a medically proven condition or... Are you saying that the severity of it is overstated? Well, okay, here's what you got to do. And, and this is what I've tried to do. I try to do all the time. And this is what drove me to that book is you got to say, okay, how do I know what I know? Uh, where did I get that information? And in this particular subject, if you didn't read the scientific literature, you can't know. It's impossible to know. You can't Google it. And so here, I'll give you an example. This paper right here from the American Academy of Neurology okay. came out on March 15, 2021. Okay, there's a scientific paper. It's about 69 pages long. Um, that's why a lot of people won't go read it. But here's what's important about that paper right there. CT is still in an observation say, state scientifically. And that is a fact. That paper even verifies it, and it goes one step further. You cannot use symptoms for clinical or medical diagnosis. So if you see anything in the paper from any doctor going, going um, well, they had stage two, that is medical malpractice. The only thing mm. that it can be used for is research. And that paper verifies it. Every paper verifies it. They use weak words like this, association. Okay, association is not causation. The two most powerful words in science are cause and link. Now the media will use those words, but nobody ever asks them, can you read the scientific literature to back that? Well, the, it journal does not of the, exist. the Journal of the American Medical Association reported that it found CTE in 99% of the brains obtained from NFL players. Uh, I mean, that's what, what we see. I don't know what to make of it. And I'm wondering, I mean, because this Joe, had a direct impact on your, your ex-teammate, Mike Webster, and Junior Seau, right. and Dave Dorsen. No, 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 no. Well, okay, let's just stop there, okay? Okay, the 99%, it was 110 out of 111 brains, right? Right. Statistically, that's wrong. There's 27,000 former NFL players. Now there's not 111. You can't draw that comparison on 111. There's 27,000 former NFL players. Without doing that, you are misrepresenting it. And even in the 99%, 56 right. of those brains had another uh, another neurocognitive disease by scientific right. standards. Okay. You have to take that disease over CT, which they did not do. And that's when we get to the abuse of science, the misuse of science, and then the awful narrative that has been created to scare people when in fact we should empower people with actual truth of how you can care for head trauma, mental health, the, uh, the things that go on. Those treatment aspects right. are a much more powerful tool right now than right. Um, playing sports or getting head trauma. Just let me say one last thing, Joe, so people understand this, you know, a scope. Leading cause of head trauma, tripping and falling. Most dangerous environment, your home. So yeah, falling yeah, off it's ladders. Probably gonna exactly. home, so. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Merrill, before yeah. we let you go, we had one other thing that we dug up here, um, and that was the CBS Sports stat that the last 16 quarterbacks to lose in their Super Bowl debut never made it back. It shows how hard it is just to get to that game. And everybody watched Joe Burrow and thought he'll be back. Maybe not. Joe, well, listen, I think, uh, Joe, the one thing guy you can refer to is Dan Marino. When Dan Marino right. first went, even though he lost to uh, um, Joe Montana, everybody, everybody thought he would go back. That's why teams win championships. Not the best quarterback, not the best defense. Teams win championships. Now, the one thing that the Bengals do have, they have a really good young football team. But there's no guarantee that that team will return right. back to the Super Bowl. That is just how, that's how it's, that's why, you know, Aaron Donald's crying. Right. There you know, you go. I, mean, I, get, I get that. Just how hard it is to get there and then win it. And then win I it. I get it. Exactly. So. Yeah.
yeah. NFL veteran Merrill Hodge. Hey, Merrill, it's great to have you. Thanks for the time. My pleasure, Joe. Always good to see you, buddy. Take care. On Balance with Leland Vitter starts at the top. Public uh, mind and then the media's telling of it, uh, of the narrative rather than simply reacting to events. But when he says we're still pursuing diplomacy, well, his own words uh, pretty much made clear that that door has been slammed shut. Meantime, in Canada, there is a convoy crackdown. Take a listen. The operational plan is moving ahead as we expected, and the contingencies we've put in place are effectively dealing with the threats we're seeing on the ground. We will run this operation 24 hours a day until the residents and community have their entire city back. The civil war is what it is. They will finish this job, or whatever it takes. Never in my 56 years have I ever experienced a country so divided um, so full of hatred towards friends and neighbors. It's happening in Canada. Hard to believe, Mark, but uh, it seems like this is coming coming to an end. We just don't know if it's it's peaceful or not. We have our people on the ground. Well, you know, remember the outrage when Donald Trump cleared the protesters out from Lafayette Square in front of the White House, uh, and they had actually set fire to uh, to St. John's Church and attacked police. These people have been completely uh, peaceful, and the and people the same people who criticized Donald Trump are applauding uh, uh, Trudeau for invoking uh, the Emergencies Act and clearing protesters out from in front of Parliament Hill. And what he's doing is far worse than anything that Donald Trump did. He's not he's not just clearing them out. He's not just arresting people. He's taking away their licenses. And their ability to pursue their livelihoods uh, for, for the ter having the temerity to protest his policies. He's seizing bank accounts without a court order, shutting down the free speech rights of people to support the protesters, which would be unconstitutional here. Uh, this is the stuff of authoritarian regimes. Molly? Well, in the last couple of years, we have seen across so many Western democracies the outrageous stripping of civil liberties and freedoms, and Canada has been particularly, particularly bad. It seems that so many of these regimes feel that the people exist to support them rather than they, the people. But Trudeau, in particular, has been, just like Mark said, a petty tyrant. He's engaged in fascistic practices. You know, he's seizing people's bank accounts for just having the wrong political opinions. This is really horrifying what we're seeing, and it is really worrisome about what's happening throughout the Western world. Quickly, Howie, I mean, the other side says there have been protests where people in Seattle and other places uh, occupy places and they get kicked out as well. Your response to that? Whatever you think of the protest, as Justin Trudeau waited way too long to get control of this. The, the Capitol was paralyzed, and I don't see why you need emergency powers to clear the streets of traffic. Uh, some of the tactics may go too far, but you can't be a prime minister who's not in control of your own country and still hold that job. All right, winners and losers. Right you're saying that we all need to open our minds because what is prestigious or culturally interesting might depend on the time, era, and people involved. <laughs> That's why it's messed up that David said that to you. I know you said somebody said it. I think it was David. <laughs> well, now, now I'm really sorry I didn't change into my Grandmaster Flash T-shirt. So... Um... I feel very overdressed for this segment. <laughs> what, what do you got, David? Well, uh, in a very different vein, I'm looking at the world's richest man. Number one this month, $224 billion. That is Elon Musk. What did he do this week? He tweeted out a meme that compared Justin Trudeau, that lovely prime minister of Canada, a very nice young man, to Adolf Hitler. I mean, this guy, Elon Musk, I know he has his moments, but he's smart enough to make a trillion or a quarter of a trillion dollars. You know, everyone loves his cars. I hope I get one one day. And he gave $6 billion away to charity, it seems. It's kind of secretive a few months ago. But he really didn't think twice about comparing the Canadian prime minister to a guy who committed genocide. I mean... He doesn't ask me for advice too often, but if he did, I think the first thing I would tell him now, richest man in the world, never go full Hitler. It's pretty obvious, I think, but nevertheless, write that down, put that yeah. above your door, put it in your mirror when you shave, never go full Hitler, Elon Musk. So fall back. I think you, you, 
you get the last word on that. It's kind of like when they asked Bill Gates about Elon Musk on COVID, and Gates said, well, I, I don't know that that's something he's worked a lot on or his area of expertise. You can be great at one thing and be out of your lane. Um, Bobito, final question to you to end the week. Uh, what are you optimistic about? What are you joyous about? I've always found you to be someone who has a smile, regardless of tough times, and we've been going through them. So that's, that's the question to you. Yeah, I certainly appreciate that. Um, well, I, I feel that, um, you know, along with the Sotheby's auction of sneakers, they have a, an upcoming hip hop auction. And uh, some of my uh, memorabilia and uh, ephemera will be featured there. And I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm talking to the Smithsonian now as well about some of my collectibles. And I just love that, that, uh, that hip hop culture, sneaker culture, basketball culture, the things that I've really represented for my entire life are coming yeah. to the foreground and, and really just uh, making ripples to new audiences and, and opening, opening, opening up minds. So I feel for, uh, I fortunate to be a part of that. Yeah. I love that. And media group, Kelloland News at 6. It's not a good report for South Dakota when it comes to mental health for the LGBTQ plus community. We'll hear from a counselor coming up. A new website will help you keep track of the scams that are rampant in your... Falls, it's news when you want it. Breaking news tonight, President Biden saying he is now convinced Vladimir Putin has decided to invade Ukraine. The president at the White House saying the U.S. believes the Russians will attack in the coming days, but leaving the door open for diplomacy in eastern Ukraine, the escalation. What's happening on the ground there tonight? Also this evening, the former officer who says she mistook her gun for her taser when she killed Dante Wright, sentenced to two years, far less than what prosecutors asked for. The judge tearing up on the bench saying Kim Potter made a tragic mistake. The outrage from Wright's family. The massive winter storm wreaking havoc. The 100 car pileup shutting down a highway in Illinois for more than 24 hours. Tornado striking in Alabama. Our team in the storm zone. California the first state to shift to an endemic strategy as COVID cases drop what it means for communities. The Olympics chief breaking his silence about the Russian skater at the center of a doping firestorm. What he says he found chilling. And the urgent recall on baby formula. What parents need to know. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. Breaking tonight, President Biden speaking to the country just a short time ago, saying he's convinced Vladimir Putin has made the decision to invade Ukraine and that he believes Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, will be targeted. A defense official telling NBC News Russian forces have 40 to 50 percent of their forces in attack position. The president again calling out Russia for using an old playbook, accusing Putin of waging a disinformation campaign, painting Ukraine as the aggressor in shelling attacks in that country's east. The U.S. believes Russia is developing a pretext to invade. At a security conference in Munich, Germany, tonight American and European leaders desperately looking for a way to peacefully thwart an invasion. It's where we start with Andrea Mitchell. With the U.S. saying there are now as many as 190,000 Russian forces surrounding Ukraine, President Biden tonight said he believes, based on U.S. intelligence, President Putin has decided to invade Ukraine within days. As of this moment, I'm convinced he's made the decision. We have reason to believe that. To be clear, I'll, you are I'll, convinced I'll that you are convinced that President Putin mm -hmm. is going to invade Ukraine. Is that what you just said a few moments yes, ago? Yes, I did. Yes. So is diplomacy off the table then? No. And even saying where Russian forces will go. We believe that they will target Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, a city of 2.8 million innocent people. Earlier this afternoon, the president hosting a call with NATO leaders. As Vladimir Putin hosts the president of Belarus, where tens of thousands of Russian troops are conducting military exercises on Ukraine's northern border upping the ante tomorrow with a more ominous display, planned tests of nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. We are in an active phase of joint military drills, he said today. And now the U.S. blames Russia for this week's cyber attacks against Ukraine. 
Tonight, the Biden administration is leading an urgent diplomatic scramble in Europe. Secretary Blinken getting Russia's foreign minister to agree to meet in Europe next week. Blinken says if Russia does not invade before then. The biggest sticking point, Putin's demand that NATO pull back and ban any new members along Russia's border. NATO standing firm against that. I think President Putin's been a little bit surprised at that solidarity, at the way that NATO uh, has come together. Also at the Munich Security Conference, Vice President Kamala Harris, her highest profile appearance on the world stage with a message to Putin. We are also committed, if Russia takes aggressive action, to ensuring there will be severe consequences. Andrea, now there are concerns about Ukrainian President Zelensky's plan to travel to Munich tomorrow. Exactly right. NBC News is reporting the administration has warned him it's risky to leave his country right now. Zelensky's spokesman tells us they'll make a last-minute decision tomorrow. Former officials tell me if he flies to Munich, he may not be able to safely fly home. Lester. Andrea Mitchell in Munich tonight. Thank you. Russian President Putin insisting he has no plans to invade Ukraine, but there are fierce pro-Russia groups there are trying to provoke a war. Richard Engel is in Ukraine. While Russian ships today conducted drills in the Black Sea, in eastern Ukraine, Russia may be building a case for war through a crisis that doesn't exist. Today, Russian-backed separatists there on sympathetic social media channels put out a barrage of images appearing to show people bracing to be attacked by the Ukrainian military. An orphanage being evacuated. Air raid sirens tested. And this supposed car bomb. No casualties. Ukraine said it was staged. One of the separatist leaders called for people to flee to Russia, women, children, and the elderly first, because he claimed the Ukrainian army is about to launch an all-out war. It defies basic logic to believe the Ukrainians would choose this moment with well over 150,000 troops arrayed on its borders to escalate a year-long conflict. Instead, Ukraine accuses the separatists, who are armed and led by the Kremlin, of firing on Ukrainian territory in an attempt to bait the Ukrainian army into a response. The separatists control an enclave about the size of New Jersey in eastern Ukraine on the Russian border. The people here, nearly two million, use the Russian ruble, speak Russian, and hundreds of thousands have Russian passports. Tonight, Ukrainian officials accuse Russia of using these separatists to create a fabricated pretext for an invasion. Ukrainian intelligence officials tonight warn that Russia is planning more provocations and has even planted bombs in separatist areas in order to blame Ukraine for casualties. Lester. Richard Engel in Ukraine tonight. Thank you. Back in this country, confirmation today from the National Archives that boxes of records retrieved from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home did contain classified documents. The Archives also says that some social media records were not preserved and that official business was conducted using unofficial messaging accounts and personal phones. A highly emotional day in Minnesota, where that former police officer convicted of killing Dante Wright during a traffic stop was sentenced to two years. Ron Allen is there tonight. Today, the justice system murdered him all over again. Dante Wright's mother reacting to the two-year sentence a judge handed down to former officer Kimberly Potter, 16 of those months in prison, for killing the 20-year-old during a traffic stop last April, when Potter says she mistook her gun for her taser. Potter was convicted of manslaughter after eight days of testimony, during which Wright's family said she didn't show enough remorse. As if killing him wasn't enough to dehumanize him. She never once said his name. And for that, I'll never be able to forgive you. Today, the 26-year police veteran faced Wright's family. Earlier, when you said that I didn't look at you during the trial, I don't believe I had a right to. I didn't even have a right to be in the same room with you. I am so sorry that I hurt you so badly. Potter's attorneys called the fatal encounter an accident or mistake, arguing she should not go to prison because Wright was resisting a lawful arrest. Mr. and Mrs. Wright, I cannot begin to understand the grief of losing a child. 
Judge Regina Chu acknowledged so there will be those who disagree with a sentence shorter than the seven years recommended by state guidelines. Officer Potter made a mistake that ended tragically. She never intended to hurt anyone. Wright's family saying the judge's concern was misplaced. This lady got a slap on the wrist and we still every night sitting around crying, waiting on my son to come home. Given Potter's sentence with time served, she'll likely be released from prison in April of next year. Lester? Ron Allen, thank you. The impact of that massive winter storm is still being felt tonight throughout the eastern half of the country. Maura Barrett now with late details. Tonight, millions recovering from a cross-country winter storm. Lost combat ships that the Russians have in the Black Sea. So I think what we can say with authority is that they have the capabilities in places that they would need them if they decide to strike. Yeah. Right. So, General Marks, let me get to that. When you look at the images Seth, Seth shared with us, um, the, this Russian training area he's referring to, which is inside a Russian-controlled, but nonetheless, breakaway region of Ukraine, right? Uh, 27 tanks, self-propelled uh, artillery, armory personnel carriers. You hear Biden says he believes Putin has made a decision. Now, General, you have laid out for me that the full invasion of this country, right, and, and, and Biden is talking about attacking the capital, a city of three million people, right, attacking the heart of this country, a massive invasion, would take not just the troops it requires to win, but to occupy, and that Putin does not have that number of troops around the borders. But when you look at what the, uh, these images show, you listen to what President Biden is saying. Where do you think we are? Is there any likelihood that Putin changes his mind? I don't think Putin's going to change his mind. I think he's, I mean, how the president got into Putin's head is clearly based on intelligence that, that our in, incredible intelligence community has provided. And that analysis has come to the commander in chief and he is now convinced that still doesn't mean he's reading Putin's mind. Putin has an intention here, and we think we know what that looks like. And that is to exercise influence and control over the political situation in Ukraine. We all look at it as the necessary step to do that requires a military invasion. Look, he has established this incredible force around Ukraine. He has threatened Ukraine, and Putin's looking for concessions. So what could happen? When you look at that imagery of the Donbass, it's incredibly compelling to me because the Russians have had forces supporting the separatists and in that area for years. Yeah. So those railhead ex railheads exist, the roads exist, the network ex exists to support that. And that's been ongoing. So what has happened now is you've now seen the movement of forces into the Donbass to increase that presence now by a factor of what? 0.5x, 1x, I, I don't know. Now has increasing presence where he can now jump into those capabilities and say, look, Donetsk and yeah. Luhansk regions now belong to me. I've settled this problem, and I'm going to have elections. And guess what? Everybody's going to vote for Russian presence here. Pretty elegant. I mean, as a military guy, for me to use the word elegant is quite a stretch. But yeah. this is an incredibly elegant move, not dissimilar to what happened. So, so John, let me ask you, you, you know, you hear President Biden's words were that, that his being convinced that Putin has decided to invade Ukraine as a fait accompli, it's done, we're not going back here, is based on significant intelligence capability. You heard the Ukrainians tell Matthew Chance, carefully did not contradict, right? It wasn't the, the sort of like, didn't take umbrage as they have recently. They simply said that they were surprised and didn't really, uh, didn't see it that way. H how do you see it when you put this together? What do you read into significant intelligence capability and the Ukrainians not seeming to be quite on the same page even now? Well, when the President of the United States says he has intelligence that says that Putin has made a choice, uh, I believe him. You know, the fact, you know, he is speaking to one person, that's Vladimir Putin. He's trying to, trying to impact Putin's calculus. He thinks Putin's made a decision, but he hasn't moved yet. Therefore, he wants to essentially call out his lies, call out his efforts to play games and sort of come up with provocations to attack. So the President of the United States is not going to ruin his credibility by providing sort of half-baked or poor poor analysis here, because Putin's the one that's going to make the calculus. If Putin says, 
oh, clearly President Biden doesn't know what he's saying, it's going to really put us in a weak position, and the president's not going to let himself do that. Now, what the Ukrainians are saying here, you know, this is a crisis situation. There's a lot of people on the ground there. People are talking to fair, different people there. You know, they're not used to getting yeah. attacked. They've been, but they've been under stress for years. They've had part of their country taken. They've got constant cyber attacks. You know, they got to worry about people making runs on banks, leaving the country. They got to worry about, you know, hospital space for people if this comes out. So they have a lot of things going here. So them, you know, saying I don't have the information or I don't see it, that I wouldn't over worry about that. That's, you know, that's the kind of thing that happened in these kind of crisis situations. The thing to focus on is what the president of the United yeah. States says, what he's trying to do to deter Putin and what happens in the coming days. So Seth, a senior U.S. official today said that the U.S. has briefed the Ukrainian military on the newest assessment. I guess, Seth, when you look at the images you're seeing, how dependent on the West, on the United States, is Ukraine right now? I think Ukraine is very dependent on the West uh, to survive if the Russians do move further than just the uh, Luhansk and Donetsk areas. If they decide to move west or if they decide to move on Kiev, it's hard for me to see the Ukrainians surviving over the long run without some kind of Western assistance. Now, what it could look like is what we saw in the 1980s in Afghanistan. That is CIA, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, support to resistance efforts against, uh, Ukraine, uh, against Russian forces in the country. That's feasible. It could be against, it, it could be a support Ukrainian conventional operations fighting uh, Russian forces. So uh, what this assistance uh, 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 could include may vary. It may vary yes. and include economic assistance and humanitarian assistance. But I just don't see Ukraine really being able to hold out for too long without some continuing Western support. No, no. I mean, even though there would certainly be, you know, insurgents, there would be guerrillas. I mean, it would be it'd be horrific, as, as the White House has said, that the human suffering and the death would be horrific. Um, but in terms of just a raw military battle, for sure. General Marks, Putin said today that the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, would be with him tomorrow during a very important military exercise, nuclear weapons, top Russian missiles on display. What message is Putin sending, and what specifically do you make of the time of it? Yeah, I think this is really very interesting. Look, we're a lot of media coverage of what's taking place in Belarus. Less so, other than through imagery, what's taking place on the border with Ukraine and then separately in Donbas. And so what I think might be happening is Putin's up with Lukashenko. They're conducting this exercise. They're present where this exercise takes place. Putin does not want to be present on the ground, <clears throat> excuse me, when he drops the flag to execute the invasion of Ukraine regardless of what it looks like. So he's up in Belarus with Lukashenko. The world is focusing in on him. Every camera is snapping. Every video is now of Lukashenko. And that's and when you Putin. do it. And oh, by the way, guess what happened? Those forces down in the Donbass okay. have now gotten into their tanks and their SP artillery. And now they're starting to expand their presence down there. John, I met earlier with the U.S. acting ambassador to Ukraine. Very few uh, American diplomats, right? They, they evacuated, obviously, the embassy. Uh, but I did get to speak to the acting ambassador, and I want to play something she said. Do you know how many Americans are left here in Ukraine? We don't know the exact number because we don't require that they tell us when they leave. We started out with somewhere between six and 7,000. We're hoping that with our messaging over the last couple of weeks that a number of those have left. And, and the messaging is, if anything, I would imagine even more strident than it was before. Our message to American citizens in Ukraine is to leave now. You can't rely on the possibility of being able to be rescued because we don't know what the security situation would be. It could be very fraught. It could be that there is no air ability for us to move around by air, and therefore it would be very, very difficult for us to get to people. So our uh, advice is to leave now because you cannot rely on someone being able to reach you if the situation worsens. John, will the U.S. leave Americans behind? Well, we, you know, honestly, we don't have the capability to take care of all Americans there, and the best thing they can do is communicate to Americans it's time to go now. Now, frankly, I think it's a big mistake for the embassy to move out of Kiev. You know, the people that the embassy needs to talk to in a crisis situation, they're all in Kiev. You know, they're not in Lviv. 
And we all know that what it's like now trying to deal with people over Zoom and these type of things. You know, we need to be able to get to people quickly in, in Kyiv. Yeah, I mean, if Americans are there, you know, a lot of them live there. There's a lot of Ukrainian Americans are there and other things. You know, they have to make yeah. their choices. Hopefully, Russia is a professional military and they're going to go after Ukrainian military. Hopefully, I shouldn't say that. I, want, I don't want it to happen. But if they do, you know, the civilians are, are, are protected. You know, when we attacked Iraq, you know, there was journalists in hotels and all types of things, and they could be relatively safe. Right. Well, we'll see. Of course, we saw, you know, what the, the Russians did uh, last time along that border um, when that uh, jet full of innocent people yeah. was shot down. Thank you, all three, very much. I appreciate your time. And I next, we're going to take you to eastern Ukraine, where, uh, frankly, you've had eight years of that ongoing war, 14,000 people dead. That's what we've been seeing there. Here's tonight. Putin is a pathetic small man. Everyone is ready to tear Russians with their own hands. Plus, the National Archives revealing it's talking to the Justice Department about the boxes of documents with classified information that Trump took to Mar-a-Lago. Could Trump be prosecuted? An outrage after a judge sentences former police officer Kim Potter to two years for shooting and killing Dante Wright when she fired her gun instead of her taser. Aaron Burnett out front, brought to you by Sleep Number. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Now, during the ultimate Sleep Number event, save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed. For a limited time, only at Sleep Number stores or at sleepnumber.com. It's time for the ultimate Sleep Number event on the Sleep Number 360 smart bed. What if I sleep hot? Or cold? No problem. The Sleep Number 360 smart bed is temperature balancing, so you both sleep just right. And it senses your movements and automatically adjusts to keep you both effortlessly comfortable. So you can really promise better sleep? Yes. You'll know exactly how well you slept night after night. We take care of the science. All you have to do is sleep. And now save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed, plus 0% interest for 36 months and free premium delivery when you add a base. Ends Monday. Do you struggle with occasional nerve aches in your hands or feet? Try Nervive Nerve Relief from the world's number one selling nerve care company. Nervive contains alpha lipoic acid to relieve occasional nerve aches, weakness, and discomfort. Try Nervive Nerve Relief. Nina's got a lot of ideas for the future. And since anyone can create a free plan at Fidelity, Nina has a plan based on what matters most to her. And she can simply focus on right now. That's the planning effect from Fidelity. United Healthcare Medicare plans offer so much more, so you can find just the right plan for you. Like the visit a doctor anywhere our RV takes us plan. The zero copays means more money for rumble lessons plan. And the visit my doctor while eating pancakes plan. United Healthcare is the number one Medicare plan provider, so you're sure to find the right plan for you, including the only plans with the AARP name. Get Medicare with more. New Vicks Vapo Stick. Strong, soothing vapors help comfort your loved ones for chest, neck, and back. It goes on clear. No mess. Just soothing comfort. Try New Vicks Vapo Stick. Look, Serena Williams, Matrix. Serena, Matrix. Serena, Matrix. Get your TV together with the best of live and on demand. Introducing Direct TV Stream. Washington is talking about price setting some medicines, but it won't stop insurers from shifting costs to you. It will risk access to medicines and future cures. Come on, Congress, that's a dead end. Instead, Congress should protect patients like you. Let's cap your out-of-pocket costs. Let's stop middlemen from pocketing your discounts. Let's make insurance work the way it's supposed to, for you. Tell Congress, government price setting won't take us in the right direction. Paid for by Pharma. Stuff. We love stuff. And there's some really great stuff out there. But I doubt that any of us will look back in our lives and think, I wish I'd bought an even thinner TV. Found a lighter light beer. Or had an even smarter smartphone. Do you think any of us will look back in our lives and regret the things we didn't buy? Or the places we didn't go. Certified turbocharger, suspension, and fuel injection. Translation, certified goosebumps. 
Certified from headlamp to tailpipe. That's certified head turns. And it's all backed by our unlimited mileage warranty. That means unlimited peace of mind. Mercedes-Benz certified pre-owned. Translation, the Mercedes of your dreams is closer than you think. Breaking news, President Biden warning that Russian troops have surrounded Ukraine from Belarus in the north and the Black Sea in the south as intelligence, uh, he says, tells him Putin has decided, and it is, he's convinced, that uh, he will, in fact, invade this country. This as eastern Ukraine, already no stranger to bloodshed against Russian-backed forces in an ongoing war, is desperately praying for a last-minute peace. Alex Marquardt is out front. The old Crimea cemetery stretches across the rolling hills outside Mariupol in eastern Ukraine. In Section 21, the Ukrainian flags whipping in the wind mark the graves of Ukrainian troops, mostly young men who have died fighting Russia-backed forces in the past eight years, an often ignored conflict that has killed as many as 14,000 people, including more than 3,000 civilians. Ruslan Pustovoit was a soldier. Now he fights with a right-wing nationalist group called Right Sector. Putin is a pathetic small man. Everyone is ready to tear Russians with their own hands. He says he knows around 200 people who have been killed. He shows us the grave of one of them, a fallen friend now etched in stone, as well as his memory. Too many comrades have died, too many civilians, too many children. In the bitterly cold, driving rain, Roman Pedityatko, a priest, prays at the towering grave of his friend, one of the first from here to die in the fighting. But Pedityatko, quiet and understated, has two sides, dividing his duties as an army chaplain in his olive green frock, which he says is his calling, and tending to a civilian congregation in this small Mariupol chapel. We are losing our best people. The church gives people comfort. If they ask what's going to happen next, we say it's God's will. We prepare for the worst and hope for the best. The people of Ukraine have shown extraordinary calm in the face of this Russian threat, but it is clearly taking a toll. They tell us to remain calm. We would love to live peacefully, to go to work, to raise children and grandchildren. We're worried. Unusual bruising. Eloquist may they're doing then maybe we should just we shouldn't have them at the olympics so yeah i suggest and a lot of other people have been talking about maybe it's time to suggest that they all be 18. this is an adult sport for adults it would make it less likely that these are children being taken advantage of it would force these agents these organizations to find a way to extend the careers of these athletes uh mariah bell who is a 25 year old u.s skater pointed out that she's really been able to make a profession out of this and that for a lot of her younger peers, they'll do it for two years, maybe, at the senior elite level. They'll compete at one Olympics, and then that's it. And they're retired at age 17, and they have back problems, and they have to sort of move on with their lives. And is that really what we want for these people? I think it probably isn't. A fascinating and sometimes very difficult Olympic Games. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about it, Stephanie Epstein of Sports Illustrated. Thanks for having me. Unlike 1.4 billion Chinese citizens, international athletes competing at the Winter Olympics do have free access to the internet. But through... Is someone trying to steal your Butterfinger? Not. The chained woman recently appeared on Chinese social media, as you can see, chained in a shack. She's the mother of eight. She'd been there for years, possibly the victim of human trafficking. Who knows, because the Chinese censor... And her both in the press and on social media. If having the games in China finally rallies the world to confront China on their atrocities and hold it responsible, fine. Otherwise, perhaps shame on us. Chris Hahn is host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast, an Olympic enthusiast, and joins us well. Uh, Chris, give it, since you've been watching the Olympics uh, on NBC, understood, give them a grade on talking about the problems of China and the Chinese atrocities? I have not heard it at all. Uh, and I've watched hours of Olympic coverage. 
So uh -oh. you make an excellent point there. I, I, I am not watching these games because I enjoy China. I'm watching these games because I enjoy watching excellent people who have dedicated their lives to sport compete at the highest level. And I think it's been amazing in a lot of ways. But I hear what you're saying. You're absolutely right. China has committed tremendous atrocities that the world continues to ignore, not just during the Olympics, but when we buy our iPhones and other smartphones that are produced in China. We can't, quite frankly, live without Chinese no. products right now in the United States of America. So we all have a responsibility to this, not just the networks uh, doing this and athletes who decide to compete for them. I mean, Elaine Gu, uh, it, it, what's ironic about Elaine Gu, she's the best in the world at what she does. I watched her win yesterday. She's an amazing athlete. But the decision she made was a purely capitalistic decision. <laughs> she could make more money competing yeah. for communist China. And she has, and you know, I don't hold that against her. Look, for years, people would compete for another country because they couldn't make the U.S. Olympic squad. What's different about her is she's the best in the world at what she does. Hold on, though. Isn't there something a little bit different? This was her quote. I'm not trying to solve political problems right now, and I'm aware that I'm not able to do everything I want to do in this exact moment. She made a decision to, to wear the flag of a country that's committing the worst genocide since the Nazis simply to make money that's that's a yeah. that's a different dis that, that is a moral decision no when you so, I, you when know, you, when I, you sell out, I, how do you wear the flag of a country and not support them I, I, i'm going to disagree with you she made a decision as a capitalist american to sell in china something that right now ceos and boardrooms around this country are making the same exact decision so why hold her to a higher standard at 18 years of age? Hey, you want to make $100 million? You want to make a million dollars? Chris, she wanted to make $100 million. Yeah, no, so I, let's let her do that. Evidently, you haven't been watching the show because we I, call out the CEOs all the time of all these companies and no, put their, I know, fa no, put, no, I, and put I know, their faces up. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, this is, the, the CEOs of major corporations have a fiduciary duty to their stockholders. And we, Lord knows we talk about LeBron James a lot here, but who better? Yeah. Who better than an idealistic teenager to stand up and make a moral stand and say, I am not going to wear the flag of a country that's committing genocide? It really, in 1936, if there were Americans who went over and wore the German flag and competed for Germany in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, you wouldn't sit here later on and say shame on them? Yeah, I would. I would. But you know what? Here's so the why thing. Is Elaine She's 18 different? years old. She's 18 years old, and she made it. She's been very clear about why she made this decision. So, so it how, was a how financial old, how old opportunity. Are you, how old are you that your morals have to then trump your financial inducements? At 22, well, that's should a good be a question. At, I mean, at 22 I, I, or look, 28? I mean, the, 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 the question, the question of what, how old you have to be in these Olympics has been a big one. I mean, that skater no, no, from no, Russia. No, no, no. I'm what I'm you saying. Know, you, 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 I, keep, I, hold on. You keep right. saying she's 18 years old, as if. At 22, then making millions to wear the flag of a, gine, of a genocide committing country I, would not, what, no what longer I, be acceptable. What, look, what I am saying is simple. Either we're all wrong from buying our iPhone or buying our TV set made in China, or, or, or we're all right, right? How am I buying an iPhone different from Elaine Gu selling iPhones in China? Uh, China. So I, I'm just saying here, the moralistic argument that we all walk, we're all to blame yeah. for looking the other way to China. I'm not going to put more blame on Elaine Gu. Elaine Gu is somebody who has committed herself to sport, to comp competing, who is by far and away, if you watched last night, the far and away, the she, best in the hey, world at what she does at the, at the age of 18. So I'm not going to put more of a burden on her than I'm going to put on a McDonald's or Apple or okay. Amazon or anywhere else that's selling in, in China. I'm not going to do that. You know what, Chris? I've said it before. You have the last word. And boy, if I ever need a defense attorney or a spokesman, you're my guy. <laughs> have a great weekend. Hey, I'm happy. I'm there for you. <laughs> I, so. I know you would be. You're a good friend. I'll see you soon of all places, where a recall election bounced three radical school board members right out of their seats. And they're not taking it well. The president of the board says the recall was a result of white supremacy. Yeah, these people are nuts. The squad's on the run, and it's because of parents like this. We're taking the wheel back from Washington all the way to Raleigh and into our local school board. Because CRT, all of that, the parents don't want it. 
It's a big fat lie. There's not one belief. If, there, if you believe in CRT, I want to tell you you're a liar because that means you look at your black neighbor and say that they're oppressed and you look at your white neighbor and say that they're evil regardless of the experience that you've had with them. This is what we're talking about. Policy going back to the parents because if you think people who love America are willing to fight for it, you haven't met parents yet. Democrats lost the working class. They're losing blacks and Hispanics, and they've lost parents. Earn big time with Chase Freedom Unlimited with no annual... The Olympic Zone, sponsored by Xfinity, proud partner of Team USA. Here's a look at the medal count. The U.S. now in fifth place with 21 medals overall, a gold, eight silver, and five bronze. Jordan Stoles is being called the next big thing in speed skating. He's back on Olympic ice tomorrow. It's a big difference from the backyard pond where Jordan learned to skate whilst wearing a life vest. Here's Mike Tirico with that. The pressure. I brought in Ensure Max Protein. Forward. It's all about choice. Are you looking for a more social, independent Day mornings on News Nation, the fastest growing cable news network. She criticized our segment on the stones, the brooms, and even the at competitive prices. A typical day looks like waking up to a continental breakfast, exercising at the health and fitness club, walking to your favorite downtown spots, and coming home to a lively happy hour with friends. Visit Touchmark Soup. And this is not, it's not a full-time job, right? What did it take to get where you are now? It took so many people supporting me, and like you said, this isn't my full-time job. It's a shocker, uh, Olympic snowboarders don't always make a lot of money, especially in my discipline. And it's been very tough, but one thing that I've learned from being from the Midwest and, and from the Upper Peninsula is work ethic. I was taught that from my family, and um, I've been a construction worker. That's how I, I pay for this, and I fund this dream. I'm a concrete worker contractor in the summers and it allows me to work my butt off and save my money up and use that money when it's too cold and there's too much snow to pour concrete so it was like the two perfect jobs other than both of them completely destroy my body <laughs> so it makes it even harder to to keep up with these kids but um for me i there's no excuses if you want it you got to go and get it and that's the only way that i was able to help fund this dream and then the support my support system is better than any Olympic athlete I've ever met. And when they come from these Olympic hotbeds, it's not that big of a deal. When you come from the Upper Peninsula, from a town of 3,000 people, it is a big deal. And the amount of support to help you through those lows, to keep you level-headed on those highs, uh, I owe it to the entire community of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. You get back home, you're wearing that medal, your 17-year-old son, Landon, greets you at the airport, gives you an enormous hug. What does he say yeah. to you? Man, he just tells me how proud he is. And I mean, just to see him, I didn't know he was gonna be at the airport. I knew there was gonna be people and I was gonna have family there, but I didn't know he was coming down. And he did a good job of surprising his dad. And I walked out and I was like, come on, man, you've cried enough. Hold it together. Let's try to be able to speak words. And then he walked out from behind the crowd and out they came. And as a dad, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, Nick, what's next? World Championships next year? I think we do the same thing we did this year. We, we bust our butt. I live in and out of my van in the summer because my commute to the gym that I train at is an hour and a half away. So me and my dog and my son will be doing some camping and working out and tra training, getting ready so that I can give it a full run. I don't want to live with the regret of, could you have gotten a world championship right after that gold medal? And I don't want to have to think about whether I could or I couldn't have because of what I did. Uh, we're going to give it the best shot and how it happens is how it happens. Well, I think it's fair to say you have a lot more new fans cheering you on every step of the way. Gold medalist, Nick Baumgartner, joining us tonight. Oh. Nick, congratulations again. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys, and thanks to everyone for the support and all the new fans and people that are in my corner. It's unbelievable for a small-town kid.
And now to the analysis of Brooks and Capehart. That is New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, columnist for the Washington Post. Hello to both of you. So good to see you. Uh, but we start again, uh, Jonathan, with a sobering uh, story that we've been following all week, and that's Ukraine. Late today, President Biden saying uh, that he's now convinced that the Russians are going in, that they will further uh, invade. He says the allies are united. There will be a devastating response. Um, we also see here in Washington, in the United States, the two political parties seem to be united behind uh, the Biden administration on this, except there was a, uh, some split, a small split this week over sanctions. But my question to you, Jonathan, is, is how much of a, how unified do you think the two parties truly are when it comes to, to supporting uh, the administration on, on Ukraine and Russia? <laughs> Sure, Judy, of all the issues we've been talking about since I've been a part of this for the last year, this is probably the one issue where there doesn't seem to be any daylight between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to talking about what consequences Vladimir Putin and Russia should, should suffer if or as the president says, when he rolls over the border into Ukraine and, and attacks uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, yeah, there was a kerfuffle over sanctions bill, but it wasn't one side saying, let's hit them with sanctions, and the other side saying, no, 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 let's not. It was, hey, we just have two competing bills on what to, on what to do. There's no daylight between Democrats and Republicans on this, just as there doesn't seem to be any daylight between the United States and the Western Alliance about what to do and how to respond and, and with what to respond if or when Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine. David, how do you see, is this, is this real unity uh, on this? I think so. You know, last summer, Vladimir Putin wrote an article on why... Uh, claiming that Russia and Ukraine were the same country. It was basically an argument for Russia invading Ukraine. It's amazing how dictators, they don't, they're not uh, subtle. They tell us what they're going to do, and now apparently they're going to do it. And so if you read that article, you could see why we are where we are. It's uh, his belief that he has the right to conquer an independent nation, and in doing so, hope to throw the United States out of Europe, and in doing so, hope to create a kind of dangerous world that he thrives in. So the issues couldn't have been bigger, and they're not issues that particularly divide Americans or members of the Western Alliance. And so I do think there's going to be a lot of unity. There will be some people who worry on the left that this is part of American imperialism to get involved in Europe. There are some people on the right who like Vladimir Putin. They see him as a manly, socially conservative, authoritarian kind of guy who they kind of like. So I'm sure on either end there will be some. But among the mainstream of both parties, I think right now there's strong unity. The Biden administration has done an excellent job of rallying the Western alliance. It's been a demonstration of why the world needs America to be a leader of the free world. Uh, whether that will last as the, as the costs ratchet up for all of us in the West, we'll see. But right now it looks quite unified to me. Jonathan, how much does it matter that, that the United States presents a united front at a, at a time like this, a moment like this? Well, I mean, the, the Western Alliance, as we're talking about, was, you know, the United States helped to create it. The United States and that Western Alliance have kept peace on the continent for more than 70 years. So it's vitally important that the United States be the leader in this. Also because, Judy, as we all know, we just came from four years of, of an administration that cast doubt on U.S. leadership in NATO, cast doubt on the need for, for NATO, a president who spent more time trying to curry favor with and establish a friendly relationship with Vladimir Putin and giving a stiff arm to America's longstanding allies in the West. So the fact that the United States is back, as President Biden said, I think it was at his first G7, uh, I think the world is very happy that the traditional role of the United States is being adhered to by President Biden. So, David, uh, unity at a, at a moment like this matters? Yeah, I think so. You know, um, uh, Vladimir Putin, Fiona Hill argued that Putin believes that America is where Russia was in the 1990s, that is to say, weak, retreating, poor leadership. And let's face it, all of us who have been covering this country have doubts about where the country is. Uh, but we're not uh, dead yet, I guess I would say. You know, we are still have the only military that's really able to project power around the world. 
uh, we still have a tradition of, of leading the Western alliance. Emmanuel Macron thought Europe should go it alone. But I think we've seen over the last week uh, that's not possible. We have to work together. Uh, and that's what's happening. And, and just in reference to what something Jonathan said, I shudder to think what would happen if Donald Trump was in office right now. Uh, you know, wh whether this would, how would we be reacting to Vladimir Putin? Donald Trump was never one to really go toe to toe with Vladimir Putin. I think he genuinely admires the man. And if he were in office right now, we'd be looking at a, a very difficult and very troubling situation. We'll let that one settle in uh, for just a moment. <laughs> but I do want to ask both of you about a, a different subject, and that is guns. Uh, Jonathan, this week we saw a, a, a settlement between uh, Remington, uh, which is a, a major gun manufacturer, uh, and the families of the Sandy Hook victims of mm -hmm. 2012, that terrible massacre at an elementary school in Connecticut, uh, $73 million. Um, it, this is over a period of time we've seen almost no federal action uh, in the direction of gun control. And just this week, we saw the Justice Department file a suit against the state of Missouri over its relatively new law, um, loosening uh, gun control, essentially moving in the direction of gun rights. What do you make of all this at this mm -hmm. moment, at this time, um, and, and the politics of it? Well, Judy, what I'm struck by is the is how uh, victims of gun violence and people who really want uh, some limits on access to guns, particularly guns that are considered weapons of war, how they're no longer cowering um, in the face of a very uh, well-funded uh, gun rights lobby, that they are now looking for ways to hold gun manufacturers accountable um, the Newtown families figuring out a way to get around the inability to sue gun uh, manufacturers directly and getting this settlement. You know, I'm in California right now having done an interview with California Governor Gavin Newsom, who today announced a series of uh, gun control or measures going after gun manufacturers, including one penned by, by Governor Newsom himself, to use the Texas anti-abortion law that the Supreme Court let go through while the case was pe while the case was pending, use that ability to you know give the opportunity for people to go after gun manufacturers in the way that Texas al is allowing you know everyday people to go after people who provide abortion services. What it says to me is that these these folks. Um, folks who want, uh, you know, to do something about gun violence aren't going to take it anymore. And if I could just read one thing to you from what uh, Governor Newsom said, and he literally said, quote, I can't take it anymore. I'm sick and tired of saying thoughts and prayers. We have had enough, and we're going hard against these guys. David, do you see real movement here in, in one direction or another when it comes to guns? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I see that much movement. I, I was surprised the Sandy Hook families were uh, able to succeed. The gun manufacturers have a law protecting them from liability, but they were able, as Jonathan said, to find a way in. And the way in was to emphasize marketing, that Remington used some marketing slogans that seem to endorse the idea that this, these guns were for offensive purposes, not for self-defense. I assume no gun manufacturer will ever use an ad like that again, and they'll talk about self-defense. And so they may have closed off that, the, that one legal way to make themselves vulnerable. Uh, I see, I guess I still see deadlock. I mean, the Missouri rule is an absurdity. The Missouri rule uh, essentially says uh, Missourians don't have to obey by a federal law when it comes to Second Amendment. Now, I'm not a big legal scholar, but I do know the Constitution explicitly, explicitly says that federal law takes precedence and has supremacy over state law. That, this is not constitutional, advanced constitutional law. And so every legal expert expects the Missouri thing to go down. And what's happening in state legislatures on issue after issue is that people are passing laws they don't expect to be <coughs> actually enacted. It's just a political statement. Uh, and so they're fundamentally unserious laws. So I'm sure that will get struck down. Uh, the blunt fact is that um, we have 250 million guns in this country. Um, I don't know how, I, I don't see any political prospect of really reducing that number. And even in the last two years, the number of gun purchases has at times hit record levels. 
You know, Judy, if I could add one more thing. Sure. What had Governor Newsom really incensed uh, is that, to David's point about gun manufacturers and, and you know, Sandy Hook families going the marketing route, the governor was incensed that there is a new gun that's being targeted to kids for purchase by kids, not the AR-15, but it's being called the JR-15. And they're touting it as being lighter and also on it is sort of an, an etching of, of a skull with a pacifier. They're marketing an assault weapon, or as the governor called it, a weapon of war to children. And this is also one of the things that Governor Newsom is trying to go after. There's so many, uh, uh, it seems like every time we turn around, there's a, uh, a new kind of gun that, that, is, that is being marketed. Only a couple of minutes left, but I, I do want to add, Jonathan, you're in California, but I'll start with David on this. Uh, some glimmerings around the country in local races, David, uh, that voters who had voted Democratic are having uh, real problems with Democratic, three Democratic candidates right now. Three members of the San Francisco School Board kicked out. First. All right, Carly, first up. It can, can be accomplished. It's very, very few people able to get through this uh, morass. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's campaign, uh, this is uh, the third item on our agenda. Some voters may ultimately not receive their ballots at all because the Lieutenant Governor's campaign instructed eligible voters to send their requests for absentee ballots to the Texas Secretary of State's office instead of their local elections office. In other words, he's hurting his own voters. Meanwhile, in Dallas, according to Dallas Morning News, 28% of Dallas County ballots have already been rejected during early voting. This is working just as planned by the Republicans, Representative Crockett, or did they mess up and hurt themselves in the process? <laughs> you know, we have a, a, a running joke in the Texas House is that half the time they don't understand the bills that they're filing and pushing to pass. And this is this is the very example of it. I mean, right now, even in reading that our lieutenant governor was encouraging people to vote by mail, this is something that they wanted to make sure election officials could not do or elected officials couldn't do. They were upset with Lena Hildago down in Harris County because she made sure that they invested so that people would know that they could do vote by mail in the midst of a pandemic. So they decided too many people in Harris County voted. So we want to get rid of that. Guess what? I have questions right now as to whether or not our very own lieutenant governor who pushed this voter suppression bill should actually be under investigation. But guess who does the investigate? In, Paxton. In. So, yeah. I, so I don't, I don't anticipate that our AG is going to investigate oh, him. But I yeah. think that they actually violated the the law that they wrote. And I knew, and I said, this is not going to be a democratic thing. This is going to be something that actually goes both ways. It's going to hurt democracy. And we heard from a bipartisan coalition of elections officials that warned them and said. This is problematic. And furthermore, on the actual vote by mail application, it says fill this in or fill this in, just like we do when we register to vote. It gives you the option. But then they kick it back if you don't have the right one of those. And it doesn't say that. So the language that they used is problematic. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they should not have kicked anybody's applications back if they put the wrong identifying information because the language, the plain language on there does not read in that way. And they should have just had to live by whatever the plain language said on the actual ballot by mail applications. It sounds as if the, their voting law is working about as well as the Texas grid. Um, how <laughs> can voters who are caught up in this mess, what can they do about it at this point? At, you know, at this point, I hate to say it, but they've got to get to the polls. And, and, and clearly, our lieutenant governor. I mean, we're talking about really arguably the most powerful person in Texas. He clearly needs to go. I mean, are, are y'all not seeing this, right? Like, Republicans, you should be fired up as well saying, wait a minute, this is what our lieutenant governor did. He didn't know that you can't send the applications to the Secretary of State. He didn't know that. And mind you, this is the Secretary of State that our governor put into place. This was the Trump guy 
So everybody should be on the same page with their scheme. And they're all confused, and they're confusing and hurting their own voters. And it, it's, it's sad because we weren't fighting for Republicans. We weren't fighting for Democrats. We weren't fighting for independents. We were fighting for democracy, something that used to matter to everyone, regardless of party. And that's what is at risk right now. People don't understand that if democracy is lost here in the United States, imagine what happens in this world. It really does matter yeah. who we put into effect because now we've got these crazy laws spreading like a terrible <laughs> cancer throughout the entire country. Unbelievable. Uh, Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett, Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, thank you very much and good luck to all of us. We're back after this. Tubes versus mozzarella stick. When heartburn hits, fight back fast with Tums Chewy Bites. Fast heartburn relief in every bite. Crunchy outside, chewy inside. Tums Chewy Bites. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. Oh, what a wonderful world. Nicorette knows quitting smoking is freaking hard. You get advice like, just stop, go for a run, go for 10 runs, run a marathon. Instead, start small with Nicorette, which can lead to something big. Start stopping with Nicorette. When your leader is asked to clean up and restoration, how do you make like it never even happened? Happen? Fire it up, Randy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By being prepared for anything! Whatever comes your way, there's a pro for that. Of Jessica's pregnancy. Yeah, 